The Biden administration has held secret meetings over U.S. troops being deployed into Gaza to occupy the Gaza Strip. And we also have reporting Now, this. I think we all knew special forces, U.S. special forces are on the ground in Israel with speculation that they're actively working in Gaza. The special forces are there reportedly to help identify hostages, U.S. hostages. But considering that they are engaged in a ground operation in Gaza, the speculation is that they are, uh, uh, that U.S. forces are in Gaza, too. So, uh, hey, maybe it, uh, it all just goes belly up and this becomes another big mess where the United States ends up losing another war because, uh, you know, we backed Ukraine and they lost and Afghanistan and Iraq are disasters. And oh, boy, we can go back in time. But here we are. We got more news. This one's interesting. New polls are coming out and they're all starting to include RFK Jr. So now it's a three way race with Biden, Trump and RFK Jr. And guess what? Guess who loses in almost every one of these polls? Well, Kennedy, obviously, no disrespect, and Joe Biden. Now, there was one poll that shows that uh, Quinnipiac shows that Trump loses if Kennedy runs. But all the other polls, they're showing that if Kennedy is on the ballot, Donald Trump beats Joe Biden. And the scary thing is it's like 35 to 37. So people are not going to be too happy about those numbers. We'll get into that. Before we get started, my friends, head over to castbrew.com to buy cast brew coffee it's the best cup of coffee you'll ever have pick up our halloween and thanksgiving i guess limited edition re-rise with roberto jr we're gonna have that up until we sell out of these and then there is going to be no more ever again but we do have a couple thousand so i think they might be up for a month or two months but this is the uh re-rise with roberto jr medium roast of course everyone's favorite is rise with roberto jr light breakfast blend when you support Casper.com uh, Casper and buy coffee here. You're supporting the work we do here as well as the coffee shop plan that we got. We're going to create physical spaces for y'all to hang out, meet up with each other and help build culture. But also don't forget to go to TimCast.com, click join us, become a member to support our work directly and get access to our members only uncensored show, which will be up at 10 p.m. where you as members can call in and talk to us and our guests. So you've got to be a member for at least six months or Sign up at the $25 per month level to submit questions. And this is a screening process we have to do because, you know, they're bad apples. They want to kind of ruin the fun for everybody. But also don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and a lot more is J.R. Majewski. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me, man. Who are you? What do you do? So I'm a uh, Republican candidate for the 9th District of Ohio for Congress. And uh, I was the 2022 nominee. And uh, unfortunately, because of some Democratic smears, I ended up losing my election. But uh yeah, you know, I'm back into the race this right cycle. And You're also a big nuclear energy guy. Yeah, former nuclear energy guy, uh, specialized in spent nuclear fuel. So Wow. All right, we'll definitely talk about that. Hannah Claire is here. Hey, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. It's the best. You should click on the Read tab on the website and see all the work from me and other journalists. And, of course, making his uh, victorious debut. Ian. Debut? debut? I'm back! I don't know. Return. return. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm back from Miami. I had an incredible, relaxing, rejuvenating spirit quest. It was amazing. And I want to give a shout-out to some people that I met along the way. Adam Sosnick from the Valuetainment Network. Thanks for having me on, Adam. On uh, on Sozcast, that was a good time. Also, Lauren De Laguna, Pixie, Amy Dangerfield from the up and coming Pink Pill podcast. You're gonna want to check it out on YouTube. Destiny had me on his show, Lichen, Destiny's chef, the man. Thanks for making dinner for us. And of course, Luke Rudkowski, who hosted me with We Are Change and Clint Russell. We did some shows. If you haven't seen him yet, go to Rumble and check out Luke Rudkowski. We Are Change. It was so much fun, Luke. Thank you. Good to be back, Tim. Right Thanks, on. man. We got Surge to my right. Yes, I'm here. Glad to have you back in. <clears throat> And uh, ready to start the show when you are, Tim. Here we go, man. Here's the story from the Daily Mail. Biden administration holds secret talks on stationing American troops in Gaza after Hamas is defeated. But U.S. officials fear deepening political peril after Israel shelled a refugee camp. Oh, boy. There's so much here. Uh, so it's not a refugee camp. Here we go again. And uh, but we'll get into this because there are civilian deaths. It's just, man, is this it, it, it just lies, lies, lies. But here's here's the worrying part of the story. First. Bloomberg, I love their warmongering headline. U.S. and Israel weigh peacekeepers for the Gaza Strip. What does that mean? Let's just say it like it is, Bloomberg. The U.S. wants U.S. soldiers in Gaza. Now, here's what's important to understand. The way they're framing it is after Hamas. After? Well, Times of Israel, citing the New York Times, says that U.S. special forces are already deployed into Israel on the ground to assist with recovering hostages. But come on, what does that mean? This means special forces are going to be working on, I mean, I, I don't see any other argument that can be made. 
You, or I, I suppose you could argue that U.S. special forces are just in a, in a room somewhere in Tel Aviv, you know, giving intel and giving advice. I don't think we use special forces for that, but maybe the most likely thing is they are engaged in recovery, which we on this show warned about several uh, or, or, or a month ago that or not, not even a month, like a few weeks ago, that if U.S. Uh, if citizens are taken uh, captive, are, are kidnapped, then the U.S. typically sends boots on the ground to bring them back. And so now that we're seeing this, let me put it all together for you. What seems more likely? U.S. special forces are already in Gaza engaged in operations, which will result in the removal of Hamas, by which then the U.S. wants to send more U.S. troops into Gaza. Well, how, how, how are you guys doing? I'm thinking about Vietnam because I saw that word peacekeeper. And I remember they started off the Vietnam uh, surge of troops by calling them advisors. Yeah. So there was, wasn't really a war, wasn't even really considered a military uh, expedition in the 50s. I think it was the late 50s when they started sending their advisors over there. And, uh, you know, it just scaled from there. So it kind of tastes like that. What do you think? I don't like it. Oh, and I also think that if there's one, if they get all the hostages out, but then there's one left, yeah. they'll use that as a reason to send 10,000 guys in they'll just, they just want to conquer the place. One. They'll just say, oh, there's still 10 Americans whose identities are being remained secret, uh, private because of the you know, risk of their family and uh, got to send in the troops. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, that's it. I mean, the U.S. is is here. Here's my fear. I hope none of this happens, but it seems like they're doing these things. So that they slowly introduce you into the idea that there will be troops in Gaza. Because uh, does anybody remember the exact date when the U.S. announced that they were declaring war on Syria and sending troops into Syria? Yeah, most people don't. And I was surprised at one point. I remember hearing about U.S. troops in Syria. And I was like, wait, what? When did we go into Syria? Like, we're, we're in Syria. At first, it was like, there are no troops in Syria. And then like, oh, we actually have bases there now. Yeah. yeah, they started as we're just sending them to help with something. It's sort of almost a humanitarian effort that we sent our military to take care of. And then it just escalates to being like, well, we need to always have a presence there because without, without us, what would they do? I mean, this is the thing that bothers me the most about uh, the way the American government leans on its military, which is to say we can send troops to all kinds of places across the world, but we do not send them to the border, which protects our own citizens. Right. We got to stop being everything to everybody or stop trying to be everything to everybody. We can be everything to everybody here in the u.s exactly mm -hmm. that's right that's let's let's do that yeah. and you know I, that's why i'm saying i see all these like uh there's like gen z videos on tiktok where they're like we should have free education and free health care and we're spending money or so the funny thing is you get this young woman and she's a communist and she's like society like this, the, the the current generation is suffering the economy is terrible we're living paycheck to paycheck when we could be having free health care and free college and i'm like here we go and then she goes but instead we're spending it all in the military industrial complex and i'm like deal all right, I'll take it. If we stop funding blowing up kids in foreign countries and then we apply whatever money is, is left from that into like giving medical care to people like deal left. You can have that if we if we all agree to stop doing this. Maybe that's their game, though. Mm. The establishment is like, let's 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 stress the American people by blowing up kids as many kids as possible around the world mm. till they beg us. We will give you authoritarian control if you stop blowing that up. That is actually countries. a technocratic tactic. They want to give us war weariness until we'll say, please give us anything but war, including putting people into pods and medicating them. Making like, them eat the bugs. Yeah. Well, I think they'll just have a taste for it at that point. They'll be like, mm, but war is so fun and we make so much money off of it. We'll continue on. Yeah, it's back to the FDR, right? The FDR theory, right? Where he goaded us into World War II by um, meddling with Japan because he needed it to satisfy his promises of the, of the New Deal. What was he doing with Japan? Well, it, they he put tariffs and and meddled with you know their trade on steel and it, 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 it there was there was a lot too. It was uh, the U.S. is supplying weapons and resources to enemies of Japan and to yeah. the Allied forces into China. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, right over a long enough period of time, if like let's say Hannah Claire and Ian are throwing snowballs at each other, and then I'm I'm making snowballs and handing them to Ian, Hannah Claire's going to be like, dude, you're both fighting me. Right. Yeah, I'll be no, really mad about no. it. I, I will no. be honest. Yeah. All I do is make snowballs. Yeah, he's right. just a Ian guy I know. Right. And just a guy I know. Yeah, right. And meanwhile, like last night, there there was a, a viral clip of a veteran that was crying, uh, sitting in his car, talking about the fact that you know the VA the health VA benefits, was, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we have veterans here that you know there's an increasing rise on veteran suicides and their their mental health and the care that they receive from the VA. It's just terrible. And I, I saw that video and I'm like, how do we help this guy? Yeah. Right. How do we help? Him? And then I'm just like, the problem is, how do you help all of them? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, the, the, I, I, I'll tell you, I despise the political elites, the political class so much. 
And uh, a lot of these very wealthy po political uh, dynasty families, and I'm not just talking about like the Clintons or whatever. Oh, there's way more than that. People yeah. need to understand. They're like, we, we know the Kennedys, we know the Bushes, we know the Clintons, but there are bureaucrat families. Mm -hmm. There are mid-level manager type families that live in these wealthy areas and their families are all getting in government and they hate you. They use your children as cannon fodder. And then what do you get? Your sons and daughters coming back to this country and they're told to go F themselves, left to cry in their cars because they can't get any medical care. And then they take more of your money and your labor and they go blow up kids with it. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen <laughs> Just, a president campaign on, I will fix the VA. The VA, VA historically has all kinds of administrative problems, but it's just sort of like, oh, I love the troops. See you guys when I see ya, even though we offer this, this healthcare system that is always fundamentally broken, right? I've never heard of a veteran who doesn't eventually have an issue along the way. And I'm not saying that there aren't VA doctors, VA systems that are trying their best. It's just incredibly difficult. I don't understand why we don't hear more about uh, fixing our own domestic support systems rather than constantly saying well we, we, we've got to have this presence on the geopolitical stage like why i'd rather I, be present in our own nation i get when ben shapiro comes out and he says here is my argument for war like not for war but like why war is happening we didn't he's like he's like israel didn't start it i, I don't know if he says we but uh, israel didn't start it hamas starts it this current round i know there's generational conflict here but I get it. Ben Shapiro says Israel is justified in doing these things for these reasons. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Why is the U.S. involved in this? Right. Why? Why? why who in this country? Th I mean, Ben Shapiro obviously thinks the U.S. needs to be involved to prevent destabilization of the region and eventually World War Three. I, I get his arguments. I would argue the inverse. I don't know which one is more likely to happen, but the U.S. sending troops into Gaza sounds like you're going to get, I don't know, Houthi rebels in Yemen and Iranian-backed militias directly attacking Israeli-like territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. going in, maybe the, the hope is that it will be such a massive shock to the rest of these, these countries, it will stop them from doing anything. If the U.S. is in Israel, they're going to be like, we can't go to war with the U.S. Yeah, I get that, that feeling of like, wow, if they finally take over, then it's going to be done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's just not the way it works, man. Right. Blowback is generational. You kill all those people, you'll see their families and their friends for, for tens of hundreds what are, of, like, what, what is the U.S. going to do? Occupy Gaza for 20 years? Yeah. I mean, it's, I joked almost when I said, make it the 51st state. Now I'm seeing things like they want to colonize. <laughs> they joke. Wanna, Walking back that statement funny. completely. It's, no, it's funny because the, the, Ian, the way you phrase making Gaza the 51st state, everyone's just like, the process there is impossible. And then it was funny because I was like, what, Ian? Are we going to send troops into Gaza and spark World War III? And now Biden's like, we should send troops into Gaza. And I'm like, Ugh. so crazy. Suddenly, he listened Ian's to got you, a call from the Biden administration <laughs> being like, more ideas, yeah. more ideas. Well, yes, not, not to mention the acute impact, right? You're, you're stretching America's military thin. And you know, as we're seeing right now, there's probably sleeper cells all over the country. And how are we going to defend ourselves? We can't. I mean, it's. You know, the way I say it is like, you know, you can't go to your neighbor's house and, and uh, chastise them for a dirty kitchen when your kitchen's terribly distraught. Right. And you know, it's, it's not about just the cleanliness. It's about being able to feed and clothe and everything else that comes along with having a kitchen. I mean, it's a decent analogy. But at the end of the day, you know, we're not even keeping our own house clean. You ever and see we're those, meddling everywhere else? You ever see those stories about the people on Facebook who have to monitor like political content mm -hmm. and like rule violations? There's a couple different versions of the story. One is like people see horrifying murder and stuff and they're traumatized and they quit. Yeah. But there was another story where it's like a couple of them where these people are working in politics in the like, we got to get rid of fake news and we got to get rid of, you know, like rule breaks, bre people breaking the rules. And they started turning right wing yeah. because they started seeing these memes and then they kept seeing them over and over and over again as they're supposed to be policing and banning these stories. They end up seeing a whole bunch of stories and then eventually they're like, Trump's right. Yeah. And so I'm just hoping that, you know, like Hezbollah and Hamas, they send in these, and in Iran, they send these sleeper cells into the United States 20 years ago. And then they're like, they show up and cross the border and they're like, when our time comes, the infidels will pay. And now it's like 20 years later and they're morbidly obese and on TikTok and they're going to pride parades and stuff. And I'm watching like, Marvel movies. Yeah, watching Marvel <laughs> movies. I'm hoping the indoctrination went the other direction with them. And they've just been like, what were we complaining about? This is great. I, I to, wouldn't be surprised if that does happen sometimes. And to segue on that, um, you know, I remember seeing that story and one of the things that I took away was that the Facebook uh, people that were monitoring these nasty memes or whatever, they were seeing all this traumatizing footage. They're getting better 
medical care and mental health care than our troops, right? Yeah. So you're a veteran of the Air Force. Yeah. Like, what's the system? What's the status of the VA? What's the problem? And what? I guess if you think solutions, I don't know personally. You know, um, I've never sought VA benefits after the after the service. I probably could for for certain things, but I just never did. I just always felt like you know, there's guys and and women that were worse off than me. So, but I do have some friends that work for the Veterans Administration, and I can tell you that you know they they communicated to me and from veteran friends. There was a pretty distinct difference when Trump was in office because he broke the bureaucracy. He he actually um, created a mechanism in which the VA doctors could be held accountable. And before it was kind of like the Fauci thing, you know, he can do whatever he wants. He's, he's not an elected official, so on and so forth. And, you know, Trump came in and, and changed that paradigm. And um, a lot of veterans were getting better service. But, you know, with Biden now, I mean, I'm I mean, he, he reverted everything within days of being in office. Do we do we need a private company that to rival the VA and do it better? I mean, I wouldn't argue that, you know, I, I think veterans are pretty simple. We, you know, we don't want much. We just want healthcare. We want, we want the benefits that we signed up for. Right. And I don't have all that trauma. I, I can't, you know, no PTSD. I don't have any of that, but you know, I have friends that do. And, um, it's come to the point where they're, they're seeking care on their own. Um, you know, they're, they're doing different things, maybe it's meditation or, you know, I don't think that's oh, necessarily MDMA therapy, bad, yeah, right? To have alternative say. ways to in intervene. I just think the issue is when, you know, you're being told, we don't know when we can see you. We have yeah. crazy delays or programs where if you come, you know, you have to be shipped to a different VA to have some sort of tr treatment and then you don't have the support in that area. I mean, it's it's a length of, it's not that any medical system in the U.S. is so great. But in this case, one of the things that especially young men in this in, in America are told is if you sign up and serve, you will have this resource for a long time. Your family will have this right. resource. And we know the VA is okay with offering veterans children's hormones, but they can't always get counselors in place for veterans who need it for PTSD treatment. I, I, I mean, think it, the priorities of the of the VA seem very strange yeah. to me. And again, I want to believe in good faith that there are people who are really trying to do as much as they can and that the bureaucracy is, is holding them back. But it's hard to say. We need more, in my opinion, more experimental treatment in the VA, like MDMA yeah, therapy and absolutely. things. Because the wars that we're experiencing are experimental wars with with experimental technology like bombs are a new technology they kill everything in the vicinity they don't discriminate right. to see that would i mean the, the brain is not i don't think the brains are built for that yet well no i agree right i, I love that scene in the movie snatch you guys ever watched that movie mm -hmm with uh, Jason Statham and uh, who else is in that? There's a bunch of guys, it's a Guy Ritchie movie. And in the beginning, you had that scene where uh, Turkish is talking to his buddy and his buddy's like, you shouldn't drink milk, it's out of sync with evolution. And then he explains that like humans evolve eating, like he's explaining the paleo diet basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, to, to, to sh uh, shift that to your point, Ian, humans did not develop over thousands of years seeing like dozens of people get limbs blown off all in an instant. No, I get it. War existed and there was brutal stuff and people being hit and people dying and there's gore and stuff. But yeah, bombs, like yeah. regular old bomb, like grenades are out of sync with evolution. Yeah. Humans witnessing that stuff is well beyond what humans, you know, grew to ever experience. I felt I was walking through New York City one day and I just felt a demolition. Uh, it's five, six blocks away. The entire earth shook. And I still feel it in my gut when I think about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a buddy that, to your point too, you know, when you come out of the military, you're used to a, a you know, a, a community of, of structure and camaraderie. And a lot of these veterans just want support. They just want to have an outlet that isn't their family. So they're not placing this emotional burden on them. And, you know, to, to some of these, uh, um, you know, holistic treatment types. I have a friend, Nick, Nick Mapson, um, who's a double purple heart recipient burnt over like 90% of his body. I just posted a thing about him on Twitter today. Absolute hero. And this guy, you know, struggled with the VA for years, was terrified to come out of his home. He had so much trauma from a PTSD standpoint, but the guy found his way and, you know, he, he's, he's doing great today, but you know, just the seeing the things that he had to go through, it's just, it's, it's horrific. If, 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 the American public understood some of the things these veterans are going through and, and in exchange for what they're asking for, I mean, this is, this is an easy, I, easy decision. I wonder if we should have maybe like, what's a good age, 15 sophomore year of high school, make, make, uh, these teens actually watch war footage, real war footage, actually ex watch and see what it's like. And then when it comes time to vote again, when they're older, they're going to be like, no, no, please. No. Yeah. Let, I'm sorry, man. The idea that we, we got to shelter our kids from the harsh realities of war means they grow up completely oblivious to it and then vote for it because mm -hmm. they have no idea. 
But imagine if you if 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 there was a young kid who actually witnessed something. You know, we, we, we like the challenge is you don't want to you don't want to break. You want to make, yeah. and you never know if you're going to make or break someone with something. But there's too many people who don't understand what they're voting for when they vote for war, when they celebrate war, and they're volunteering you all to go and do it, not them. They're going to vote for war. They're not going to go fight it. Right. They want our men and women in uniform to go to go do these things. And then when they come back, it's like, I forgot about it. Well, I just read that in uh, Ukraine, they were the draft age has been raised again, I think. And the average uh, Ukrainian male fighter is 44, 43, 43 years, years, old. years old. Average. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pulling. They're pulling people off trains. Apparently, there'll be like a 50 something year old guy in a train and they'll walk in and grab him and be like, nope, front line. And they just send him right to the front line, hand him a gun, say good luck. So I'm with you on exposing people to the horror ahead of time. But then I also still want people to volunteer for the military because we need domestic defense. And I think I'm not sure what you think. Maybe the balance is. JR. Yeah, but look, do you. So I, I used to work at this office and their hiring practice was to put up fake ads for what the job is. This is what all these nonprofits do. They call it campaign work. They say work on campaigns to save the forests or whatever. And then what happens is when, when you come in for the interview, they say, oh, you know, you'll be filling out forms and talking to people about what you believe. And they go, okay, then you bring in for another meeting. And then they finally land on, you're going to be asking people for money, strangers on the street. And they're like, the reason we do this is because if we tell people what the job is, they won't show up. And I'm like, so you think it makes more sense for me to interview 50 people of which 49 leave instead of just waiting for the one guy to show up who wants to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so th that, that's my view with, you know, the, with, with the military in this regard. Obviously, you don't want to shock young people in horrifying ways, but they do need to be aware of what it really means to be, you know, uh, to be in the armed forces, to be a, to be combat infantry and what it means to vote for it. And then perhaps the people who volunteer, are the people who truly understand what they're signing up for. Yeah, I mean, I feel this would be the most helpful in high schools in blue areas, right? <laughs> I mean, in my personal experience, you know, I grew up in Connecticut, blue state. My brother enlisted in high school to be in the Marine Corps, and his high school fought him tooth and nail the entire way. He was 18 all of his senior year, so he could he could be enlisted. But they were like, no, don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to do this thing? You have to be over here. You have to think they have no military family members themselves, maybe their grandfathers, but they have, there's no actual connection to it. And so there is a a idea that that's for someone else to do. That is some, that's not for me, that's not my experience. And again, like this is an issue I feel very strongly about, but in addition to the combat, in addition to the, the physical labor that goes into the military, in addition to the impact it has on the family, if you choose to get married and get shipped around the US, I mean, it's a really serious sacrifice. The other part is that we don't transition people out of the military very effectively. Yeah. So we don't offer career counseling in a way that people can really say, this is what I did in the military, this is what it looks like in the civilian I, world. It's a system that we, both depend on and are willing to send other people to go fight. But when people are here domestically, we don't think about them. I wonder if a lot of the problems of wokeness and communism and, uh, you know, far left ideology could just be solved by exposing young people to the realities of life. I, you know, when I see these videos and they're like, we should have free, free education and free health care. I'm like, this person's never had a job when they're like, uh, you know, you know, there's more empty houses than homeless people. We could put we could house and feed every homeless person. I'm like, this person's never worked with the homeless and they've never owned a house. Yeah. So how you know, let's expose young people to the realities of life and then have them be like, oh, I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think there are young people who grew up and, you know, the reality is it's typically children teenagers that are growing up in more impoverished more blue collar areas who have to see what their parents are going through they're living in a circumstance where they are exposed earlier it's the and this is not to be mean to them but it's it's the upper little middle class to wealthy uh teenagers in america who are in pro super progressive schools especially super progressive private schools who then go on to say i know better than everyone else on the face of the earth because i know that who's oppressed and i know what the world colonizer means that i support that group i mean it's ridiculous it's very out of touch but it's not true universally it's just, uni just it's true in well, places with well, influence i'm a living example of that you know i grew up in a blue collar family i grew up in uh you know toledo ohio in the one of the worst the, the, the worst neighborhood in my district and uh you know my dad worked at uh toledo jeep built cars for a living and um you know i didn't have a choice when i got out of the out of out of high school and to your point you know if i would have known more about college i would have started college earlier and nobody was there to teach me. I had, you know, I'm the first grandkid to ever graduate from college. Oh, I hate college. So college is a scam. Oh, it I'm, is. I'm, I'm with Randy Marsh on this one. I just watched South Park Pandaverse. We watched it earlier today. 
I love it when they're like, college is a scam, and they fire, a, they try to fire a catapult into it. <laughs> oh, it was. The, 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 I recommend South Park: The Pandaverse. It's really good. It's not just about wokeness. It's about uh, the failures of the economy, and they roast the they roast communists so so well. Yeah, it's I, it, anyway. It's the color revolution, man. But you know, back to what I was saying with with being blue collar, right? Um, you know, not having a choice when I got out of the, uh, you know, out of high school, what path was I going to take? You know, I had a very strict, r- really strict father and military just became clear as my only choice and absolutely love the country. I've always been patriotic and, you know, it, it seemed like this was my path. At least four years, I could start off somewhere and, um, you know, growing up, watching my dad work 12, 16 hour shifts every day, coming home, couldn't coach the baseball team, you know, things like that, you know, it, it, it it really had an impact on me. So, you know, after the military, um, you know, my dad and I couldn't sit in the same room and not agree that these walls are gray, you know, but after the service coming home, had a proud dad, you know, we became became really good friends and, you know, the military, you know, changed my life. But to your point, Tim, if I would have known about certain things at an earlier age, I would have made different life decisions, but. Yep. I think college has become a lot more of a scam since the internet, because before it was a good place to go congregate with geniuses and learn about data but now it's so uh obsolete in my opinion maybe for certain things it's worth going when it became a money machine yeah it's it's, it's not just that but you know uh the argument i often would hear from people back in the day about college is it's where you go to congregate with other like-minded individuals and work on ideas and i'm like but i've been doing that my whole life Mm -hmm. yeah and then you look at without naming any of these individuals there are certain uh, uh people would call them prodigies you know, young people who were in certain in certain fields succeeding at early ages, but the reality was, so these people would go on. Where they were online when they were like twelve or thirteen, and they were in physics forums talking with physicists. And then people were like, "Wait a minute, this kid's fifteen. The person who was helping us theorize these things is a kid." And they're like, "Oh, he's a prodigy." It's like, no, he was just exposed. in this space and exposed to it yeah. and contributed. The guy who built and developed uh, Minds dot com, the company that I co founded with Bill Ottman's name's Mark Harding. He's the C. Uh, CTO and uh, he was 17 when he started building it but he just learned it all online you yeah. just look copy paste read the data this is, means that this means that and he just I think universities made sense when they were about getting people in places to discuss ideas and advance you know academic knowledge that that was great but th- right now college is actually just an extension of high school right I mean it's unusual it, it's it's the American university system where you're having assignments to turn in every week or stuff like that. Like that was not how these right. institutions were founded. You're <laughs> supposed to come up with like a thesis that you work on for four years and that's all you do. And now we have general education classes and this, that, and the other. And it's ultimately all to make money with especially uh, government backed student loans that they still issue even though we know it's setting up millions of students every year for complete financial ruin. And so ultimately it's marketing this idea that you will get a better job you'll have something else because of this de- the degree but the degree doesn't actually make you better a better thinker it just tells you that you can comply with the rules set out for you which i don't personally think is a value that i want to instill in children you know at past a certain age you want young children to learn obedience and discipline but when you're at reach maturity you should be in- ex- expanding your intellectual curiosity and pursuing your interests and that's not what happens in the universities anymore so uh the south park pandaverse episode that everyone's been talking about it's marketed as the characters are replaced by diverse women. So Cartman is a black woman now. But there's there's an A story and a B story. And the B story is that no one knows how to do anything. And so uh, Randy Marsh, Stan's dad, the stove breaks. And he's like, I'm going to show you kids how to fix the stove, the stove door. So he calls the handyman. And then the handyman's like, well, I'm going to have to come back later. You're, you know, the, the, the screws are stripped. And he's like, wait, I'll pay you more money to stay and fix it now. And he goes, ah, someone already paid me more money to go fix theirs now. <laughs> so what happens is all the, all the handymen end up becoming billionaires. And then when none of the regular people can get their light bulbs fixed or their power outlets fixed or anything fixed, they start blaming the billionaires because the handymen are all billionaires. And then they start holding up, we are the 99% signs. They're saying capitalism has failed. They're like, all these billionaires are withholding their access to this work and we can't get anything fixed now. It's their fault. Capitalism's failed us. And I'm just like, it's really, really funny because it exemplifies so much of what the left complains about, especially young people. They're just like, if they can't have it right away, it's the rich person's fault. Yeah. It also highlights the value of artisanry. And like before you were lucky to find someone that knew how to forge a steel sword. You had to spend time with that person. Now we're in a, we're in a point in history where it's all available. If you want to become a plumber, you can figure it out. But if all this power goes out, you're not going to, 
you're going to have to find a plumber to learn or just trial and error. Books. Maybe books if you have access to them, if you're lucky and maybe you had one and there's still a library standing. Well, so that, that was a funny part of the show is that they basically, spoiler alerts, I guess, they're just like, the real, the real problem was college. Randy's like, if I didn't spend eight years getting a PhD in geology, I'd not actually fix things and do work and then I'd be rich. And so they go and start protesting the colleges. It's good. It's really good. Well, and like, what do you want out of life, right? If you want to make a certain amount of money so you can have a career you like and then also pursue your interests and, you know, start new businesses or travel or whatever else, going to college doesn't actually make sense. You're going to massive amount of debts. You don't have the guarantee of job. You should look at trades. You should look at all kinds of other things mm -hmm. where it takes less initial investment. You're able to, if you have to take it alone, pay it off much faster. And then also you have the option to work in a variety of settings. This is the thing about, you know, and I, I, I got my bachelor's in English. I feel comfortable saying this who knows what i was gonna do with that what, what does that even mean like what's a bachelor's in english so the bachelor's degree is just the like four-year degree no, for, I get it, for english it's english literature so i can tell you a lot about poetry i can uh, write some interesting essays my second one i huh. have two degrees the second one was in communication studies and so you took basic classes in communication theory some like public relations stuff it worked out it's if fine we open a poetry store do you think it would do well? i'm in slam poet well, that was the thing Claire Claire when i hit, reached the end of my four-year degree they were like would you like to work for Teach for America? And I was She's like, I don't want to be a teacher. She's a communicator, though. So I mean, this yeah. I, absolutely. I already knew how to talk beforehand, right? right. I could have right. spent four years reading the news, doing something else. I'm grateful for college. I, you know, I had a good experience because I like, I liked being in class. I liked learning. See, but I, do I, I think it's worth the investment? No. Well, see, I reject this, right? This is one of the arguments I've heard a lot from people when they're like, I think college was good for me. And I'm like, you don't know if it was good for you because you don't no, know what you would have no done idea. if you didn't do it. And to be honest, the things that I tell people about college is that I was really grateful to go to a different environment. I went to college in Texas. It's, you know, more Bible Belt. I was around people, very different people socially. And that was interesting. That was, that was a, a prof had a profoundly uh, positive impact on my life. But it's not to say that college is the th reason I am where I am to uh, today. It's just I'd, I'd, something I'd argue I did for it holds you back. And this is this is what a lot I would say to a lot of people I knew in their you know mid twenties or whatever. They're like, I went to college and I'm doing all right. And I'm like, look, man, I'm not trying to be a dick to you, but you're a shift supervisor at a Starbucks making fifteen dollars an hour and you're twenty five. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are people who have started their own businesses by the time they were twenty two. I know people who became managers of fast food restaurants by the time they were twenty three and they're making you know forty thousand a year. So. I'm not trying to be it. You know, it's, it's like you don't want to be a dick to someone who's like, I think I'm doing all right because you want to cheer them on. But it's like, look, man, we can't keep encouraging people to stunt their lives by going to college instead of learning how to actually work in ways that can benefit their fellow men. For sure, especially since it's, it's not the only option. And that's the thing that I think American high schools get wrong, which is that they, they use the statistics of how many people matriculate to college to say that we are a really good high school. But that's a bad, that's a bad statistic. You might as well say, our graduating class is entering multi-million dollars worth of debt. Do you think we are a good high school? That would be a more accurate way of representing what they think students can accomplish. It's making me think of a question for you, JR, about what, knowing that like the trade, how valuable trades are and the ability to build, you you were project management for energy companies mm -hmm. or at least one in particular, what company? First Energy. For First Energy, you mm -hmm. develop, you know, you're saying a campus at one point or you, you've designed. What made you, or what made you decide to pivot away from that into politics? Well, it, it kind of goes back to you know where I started so I started in the union at the power plants and um, the barrier to management for me was a degree it was, it was a prerequisite in the in the power industry so I ended up finishing my master's degree I you know I was a really hard worker and I caught the attention of the site vice president when Davis Bessie nuclear power plant in Ohio had the uh, reactor head incident and um you know, I, I just was a hard work and, and a lot of it comes to what, from what Tim's saying, right? You, you apply your hard work ethic, but then you supplement that with the knowledge that you gain, you know, from college. I went to college late in life. I, I didn't go right after high school. You know, that was a service. So, you know, the pivot for me though, to politics was, um, COVID. Uh, I was traveling the country 200 some days a year. I was working at different nuclear reactors across the country and uh, COVID had me working out of a home office and I became politically active because of Donald Trump. Uh, my dad was a lifelong Democrat, and he was a huge Donald Trump fan, and he talked me into, you know, paying more attention to Trump, and I did. And um, the the long story short is in 2020, um, a veterans group and I that I support, um, I painted the Trump 2020 logo on my big, big yard in, on Lake Erie, and it went viral. I was on Fox and Friends, and then I got a call from President Trump. And wow. it, it just it just grew from there. And um, I ended up developing a, 
a decent Twitter following for a guy from Northwest Ohio. And uh, when I watched what happened during the 2020 election and I watched what was going on in my district, you know, 40 year Democratic incumbent doing nothing for us, I decided that I was going to use the political capital that I gained and just shake some trees. It was a Democratic plus 12 district. I had no chance in hell to win. But luckily, right, you know, right before the right after the before the primary election, they redistricted the district flipped to a Republican plus two point nine. And here I am, the candidate. I beat two elected officials, state elected officials, absolutely demolished them. And I was on my way to run in the general election. So the pivot for me was just becoming aware of what was going on in American politics and knowing that I grew up in poverty. I grew up in a struggle and what I was seeing happening um, by these oligarchs and these, you know, wealthy folks, it just, it, it didn't make sense. The, let's, let's pull up this, uh, the story. We have this poll from Quinnipiac. This one's got people all hot and bothered. 2024 presidential race stays static in the face of major events. Quinnipiac university national poll finds RFK jr. Receives 22% as independent candidate in three way race. Now, the interesting thing here is that with the independent candidate, they say that Joe Biden wins. They say, uh, uh, well, let me, let me just pull up the actual uh, Quinnipiac here from uh, 538. They say, actually, it looks like if they include Cornell West, but Joe Biden gets 39%, Trump gets 36 and Kennedy gets 22. Now, a lot of people are responding, especially Trump supporters, being like, what's 22%? Who that? Are you polling? Now, Quinnipiac also has this poll, including Cornell West. I love it. If Cornell West runs... Apparently, Trump still loses. OK, <laughs> wait, hold on a minute. I, I'm, I'm like, it, it's really funny when they put both of these metrics out at the same time. OK, so it's Biden, Trump, Kennedy on the ticket. Kennedy gets 22 percent. But if you add Cornell West, someone pulls one point away from Donald Trump. Are they implying Cornell West will take one percent of Trump's voters? Cornell West, he's, he's he's super far left, right? I mean, I just. That's ridiculous. He's, he's courting the same demographic as Trump, 100 percent. Sure. I, that's just it's a ridiculous uh, idea that Trump would lose because of West and Kennedy. And when you look at all the other polls, take a look at this one. Redfield Wilton strategies, Kennedy, 10 percent. Trump wins 40 to 38. They have another poll showing it's 35 to 33 with Kennedy at 10 percent, probably because they might have Cornell West in there. You have this one from McLaughlin, Biden, 35, Trump, 38, Kennedy, 12, West, 2. McLaughlin also has Trump winning all the other polls, at least uh, Abacus has a tie. So there's one poll showing Trump losing, I guess, technically say Quinnipiac has two. And then Abacus showing a tie and the other polls, we've got uh, one, two, I believe three, four, uh, four other polls showing Trump wins with Kennedy on the uh, on the ballot. I, I don't know for sure, but I'm I'm definitely leaning towards I do not see Trump voters leaving. I'm talking about I'm not I'm talking about MAGA. I'm talking about moderate independent types i don't see them being like i'll oh, vote for kennedy instead of trump some maybe but it's mostly going to be democrats who think biden can't win and that biden is horrible he's corrupt he's a warmonger and they're going to vote for for, for kennedy yeah, i agree i think i think biden's doing all the work for him so, you know all the work for these other candidates right now in my district in ohio it's it's highly independent and you know i, I see a huge swing for um voters driving towards Trump just because of what he's standing for and and the fact that he's getting attacked so terribly I mean, they're, they're they're seeing the reality of politics right now I yeah. heard a Biden speech from I guess four years ago and man he sounded clear like a normal guy and now when you listen to him it is freakish he is just tired it's and, exponential mm -hmm. yeah. the, you know it's like the the decline accelerates the older you get so it's a curve straight, straight down. I'm so concerned. I'm torn because I'd like to meet him and help his help his brain a little bit because well, he is our commander. But you can't help his brain. Either. Just listen to him. Like let him kind of wake throw. himself up a little bit. <laughs> well, and it's gen degenerative, right? I mean, that's the sad thing about yeah. dementia illnesses, right? Like any kind of elderly atrophying, it it's not reversible. It's right? not coming back. You can't. There, I, I've seen THC consume amyloid plaque, which is the cause of Alzheimer's in a, in a microscope. I'd have to continue to look for more data to back that up. But I think I believe I've seen that. Also, I hear psilocybin helps people in older age. There might be in the future, but right now we have very little, if any way at all, to slow or stop these progressive degenerative diseases. And I think that's stem sad. cells right to the brain. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's something and maybe if we're testing them, you know, experimental treatments, you know, give, uh, giving us an option in the VA, maybe you know, Biden okay. can get have a chance to try this out. But 
realistically in the next year he is not going to suddenly imp- improve considering we've seen a consistent decline in the last so three if years. he walked into a chamber and it closed and, it was like, and he came out and he looked like 38 would you vote for him no <laughs> if he was healthy like a 30 year old he's a democrat i mean i he's still evil the thing is, he can mean? look like, 38 now he's young evil he, he would look 38 and i still need him to close the border which he won't do he wasn't he ever, to you know what i mean get all that biden money back though from the the, the gap the end of yeah the, what's this what's the story now they, they forty thousand dollars in, in laundered payments oh what's that yeah yeah, there's like uh, the, the, the so there was a the two hundred thousand dollar payment from his brother. Mm-hmm. Now apparently there's a report about forty thousand dollars paid directly to Joe Biden, which appears to be laundered from China. Mm-hmm. Man, I'm glad you brought up the border. It's just I, I probably you guys talk about it a lot. I hope hopefully it gets talked about a lot. Are they building it up right now? Because it's like, yo, if we're really gonna about to spark a war in the Middle East or like jump into the fire over there, we better have closed borders. Yeah, I mean, at this point, that would make sense. Yes, if, yeah. if if you were in a dangerous neighborhood, I've said this a hundred times on the show, but if you were in a dangerous neighborhood, you would lock your own front door, and instead, we're like, no, it's fine. Let's open all of the windows. Let's just pretend yeah. like everything it's, is cool. But it's not just that. If you're going to throw a flaming bag of feces at your neighbor's house, you're going to also lock your doors mm-hmm. because your neighbor is going to get mad at you. Now, I'm not. I, I guess I can technically say the U.S. is basically doing this because we shouldn't be involved in this stuff anyway, but. The U.S. getting involved in all of these conflicts and leaving the back door open. Yeah. And the front door with Canada. Like, I know there are allies, but the that doesn't mean Canadian Canada. or um, that doesn't mean like Chinese tanks can't just roll through central Canada into like no, Wisconsin. There's no barrier, dude. No. There was a there was a story about a bunch of like 20 year olds and they just drove down the border and then just turned into the United States. Mm-hmm. And I think they got in trouble. The Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Because there's no barriers there. No, no. You know, there's just like, it's like the trees are cut and they have drones patrol sometimes. You go to the southern border and it's like some some areas, you know, there's nothing, but there's a lot of bollard fencing. Yeah. And then there's patrols that go up and down and you've got the militias down there. Yeah. Didn't we have the Chinese military was caught practicing some drill or were dr- performing military drills in Canada last year, if I'm not mistaken? I don't think they were caught. I think that was like a joint effort between Canada and China. Yeah, it seems like the Chinese don't want any military conflict with the U.S. They had Gavin Newsom over there to talk to Xi, President, I was going to call him Emperor Xi, President Xi. Uh, but, but, you know, and they look, were like, we're going to do anything we can to preserve peace between us. I, but I, that, I wouldn't put it past him to say that and then declare an invasion. I, that's I, like stuff Hitler would have done. I saw a video of a guy in China eating at, I think it was a Pizza Hut, and they can stuff the crust with hot dogs. And when I saw that, I was just like, we're doomed. You know, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I would, I wouldn't this say half kidding. End. I would say I, that's, that's 75% a joke. The reality is they are uh, uh, competing with us in, in a lot of ways that we should be the best at. And I don't literally mean putting hot dogs in pizza. It's just that we're giving up our manufacturing only now in the past several years seem to have realized that we've given up the in- industry and manufacturing we need to maintain an economy. And now you're seeing China's they're, they're cranking away. They're burning coal, baby. They're just smogging it up. And by the way, I'm going to interview James Tour at Rice University's leading graphene scientist on Earth. Uh, and he, they're working on flash jewel uh, graphene where they hit carbon trash with lasers and can produce this black powder, this stuff. This is the 21st century building material that we'll need to revolutionize our country with. I don't know, though. One of them, probably. Maybe. Yeah. It's just like the graphene story came out 20 years ago. It was like graphene, the wonder material, 20 years ago. And so we got some cool stuff from it. But... And I wonder, I think it's really going to come down to the basics. Are we producing steel, right? Are we, are, are we? Well, I think you can use, you can put this stuff in with like carbonized steel if you're going to make it and make it stronger and lighter. And also with, um, with, car, with coal, like you were saying, we burn coal. You can upscale coal into graphene and burn it cleaner. So there are some, I'm, I'm very excited. It's going to be a uh, Friday afternoon. So keep in touch on my Twitter and you can watch it there. So there, let's reindustrialize. Go for it. What were you saying? Oh, I was just saying, I mean, I, I I want to believe in science and innovation. I really do. But I get sort of uh, frustrated with it when ultimately, you know, if if graphene is the future, maybe it is. I don't I know nothing about it. But is America going to do something about it or is it going to be China? Right. Like what country is actually most likely to be ahead in terms of manufacturing these things? And I would assume it's the country where we put all of the manufacturing. And so in some ways we've 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 uh, hamstringed our own ability to embrace innovation by shipping all of these things overseas. I mean, even if someone in a lab at a university in America comes up with something, ultimately the technology is getting shipped out of the country to develop, in my cynical opinion. I would counter that uh, those would become obsolete factories over there now. start building new ones that focus on flash jewel 
creation. If we build them here, I'm okay with it. I just don't know that we will. Well, that's what we're trying to do in Arizona and places like that where we could actually have these factories. So if that actually happens and a lot of like the reasons for taking Taiwan or protecting Taiwan become secondary to us actually having the factories back in the United States. That's not all manufacturing though. Like China can still um, out manufacture us with like raw products. But when it comes to like technical manufacturing, yeah, that's going to be huge in the next 20 years. The biggest place we're handicapped in comparison with China is in, in regulatory framework. Yes, I mean, sure. if you look at, you know, how our government hyper regulates, not only the, uh, the, the, the industrial side of manufacturing, but then the energy side. Right. And I mean, that's, you know, my, my kind of my wheelhouse. Right. And that's why we have, you know, the, the stifling of small modular reactors. And, you know, we have companies that are American innovators that are having to take their technology to Canada and go through the re regulatory board there, hoping that the NRC here, the nuclear regulatory commission here will finally open up the gates and allow them to uh, build SMRs here. And we're, we're, we're losing out on, on, on yeah, every, in every What's an SMR? small modular reactor. Mm. How does that work? Um, it's essentially, you know, it's it's a mini reactor that is you know mechanically a small modular of, reactor of melting right? down. You can you can power a small city with a reactor the size of this room. You need no operators, I and mean, it can't melt down. Right, cannot what, melt down. What, what kind of what, what's the fuel source? Um, still uranium, but it's 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 a um, too small passive or? technology. I mean, it 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 doesn't rely on operators. The 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 way it's designed. I, I'm no, I'm no physicist or, or nuclear engineer, but, um, you know, the, w the way I understand it is, um, the recirculation system, the cooling system, they're all, you know, they're all passive and reliant on condensation and, and the, you know, the systems working in cohesion with one another. So there's no oper operator manipulation. What, what about thorium salt? We've heard a lot about that. Um, yeah, I think thorium salt's an, another awesome opportunity for us that we're just, I mean, there's, there's, salt? there's, there's reactors out there that. I mean, there's there's ways to convert Fuel. our retired coal plants into thorium salt reactors. There's really? A, yeah, there's America. I used to work for a guy that invented that. Um, name is Dr. Singh, and he introduced it to our federal government, Department of Energy. They don't, they don't like why, it. Why aren't we doing these? Th why, why are we not doing it? Because the money is not going in the right pocket. It's because of Greta Thunberg, isn't it? That son of yeah. a <laughs> She's hungry I mean, for the cash. Greta! <laughs> in your experience, how has American... How's the... Uh, American public's opinion shifted on nuclear because I feel like that's ultimately if there were people calling for it eventually someone would do it right I mean they're doing it the the problem is I mean there is a there is a um a specific paradigm around nuclear power people drive by cooling towers and they think that's the reactor and yeah a lot of it has to do with the nuclear power plants not having to market over the years they've been in they've been in um you know regulated environments where they know they're going to charge a certain amount per megawatt you know and, and and they're going to get paid because people have to turn their lights on but then when you have different forms of energy that are subsidized by the federal government that undercut the market then nuclear becomes well i, I blame the simpsons but yeah. for real, the, the, so this is actually true. It, it, Simpsons is considered to be a factor, maybe not the biggest, in why there is resistance to nuclear energy because people grew up watching this joke of Springfield, of mutated fish. Three-eyed mm -hmm. fish. Uh, Three-eyed fish, Blinky, and meltdowns, I think, are a theme of a dozen episodes at least. And so people are consuming media and they're believing these things are based on reality. Right. And they say, well, every joke has its truth. And it's like, no, like, there, there's not going to be a nuclear plant so close to you like this. It's, it's not going to blow up. You're not going to die. There are less deaths from nuclear power than from coal. And like, it's it's exponential. The nuclear power industry is the safest industry, one of the safest industries in the country. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what's the biggest misconception about radiation damage? Like, what, I think what happened is uh, when Chernobyl melted down, it just, what, what all the, the spent nuclear corium or whatever was just there. So it was constantly irradiating it, it the environment. Burst it into the air. And then you had the meltdown, which created the elephant's foot. And then had they been able to extract the corium, then would it have no longer been irradiating and it'd go back to normal? I mean, if you remove the source, yeah, then you would have no, no radiation. So but I have the, a theory the problem about with Chernobyl was that when it exploded, it sprayed radioactive par uh, uh, particulates everywhere, which blanketed down over the region. And when the, when the West was like, hey, Russia, what's going on? They were like, nothing's happening. Everything's fine. And they're like, uh, now we're getting slammed by radiation, radio like radioactive particles. So we know something happened. Yeah. I was thinking about corium meltdowns. Corium's like the stuff in the middle that when it gets really hot, it goes and it goes through cement and it'll just keep melting mm -hmm. down. If you pour gold into it, that it will create act as a superconductor and allow the corium to cool itself off and release the heat. So it'll, it'll then it'll harden and then you could extract it. Hmm. 
I'm not sure that uh, gamma rays wouldn't pass through that. I mean, if if it could be X-rayed, then you can still have uh, you know a fission product. I would assume. I mean, the only real shielding mechanism that you're going to have from um, radiation of that source is going to be water or lead or high density concrete. It wouldn't yeah, be to shield; the, it would just be more to extract it, so you could so it gets out of its liquid form. Even then, you have to worry about the dose exposure that you're going to get as a human. You can only get so much before your you internal to, organs are going to be. I, you have I, to send a robot in yeah. to do it. I think the biggest misconception, based on my personal experience, is that you're dealing with gamma wave radiation instead yeah. of alpha and beta particles. Right. So this is what I learned when I went to Fukushima. They give me these, they give you this cloth suit to put on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, is this a joke? And they were like, this is what you have to wear. Why? You, you're, they're not worried about you getting bombarded by waves that go through everything. They're worried about the particles landing on your skin, which are radioactive, and then you eating them or getting them in your lungs. Yep, so that's an internal source. Yeah, so, yeah. so what, what you're supposed, you wear these, these cloth suits, and then when you're, when you're leaving, you take them off very carefully, they bunch, bunch them up and throw them in the garbage. We mentioned thorium salt earlier. Can you really quickly generally explain what that is, a thorium salt reactor? Oh, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse, but I know that, you know, the thorium salt is essentially heated up probably through the, through the uh, super steam process, and then that kind of creates uh, a, like a resonating heat source, which then continues to create the super steam, which turns the turbine, right? Isn't so, that really funny? That's all it is. Yeah. We, we like, we, we pressurize a tube mm -hmm. so that it pushes steam, which spins. It's kind generator. of beautifully Gigantic simple. Like coil. I sort of like that, you know? Yeah. One other what question. Was it? Just, it's a big magnet spin, creates yeah. an electrical current. That's mm -hmm. it. That's, there you go. So my other question Science. on nuclear is what about fusion? And I know that these get conflated because they're not, even remotely the same process, but they're both called nuclear power, which is kind of weird. Maybe so. But what do you think about fusion? Is that even anything you've ever studied? Do you no, I mean, you know, in, in my opinion, the future again it goes back to the standard way of, of 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 nuclear fission, right? Just having smaller, more manageable, less scary to the public reactors, things that you know take out the human element, because that's really where you've seen these meltdowns or where you've seen these close calls. What the general public hasn't been communicated to is like there was always a safety actuation system that stopped the general public from being harmed. There's you know what they call defense in depth there's always like three to four different layers of defense you know with these nuclear power plants at least in the united states right europe has totally different standards but here in the u.s you had davis best you, you had three mile island i mean we were pretty far away from actually having a meltdown but you know when it, it's uh communicated to the public it's all about you know scaring them have you heard of those nuclear diamond batteries where they have like spent nuclear fuel yeah. and they put it inside of like a diamond and yeah. it just gives you a low pulse of yeah. energy. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain that? Really I don't quick? know. I've heard of them, but I don't know much. I don't know much. They give you like 10,000 years of electricity. Really For what? Low. Like a phone? Um, yeah. Things like that. Really, really low charge. And then I guess you could have a lot of them to create a greater charge, but it's actually nuclear waste inside of a diamond inside of like carbon. That's what we're missing out on is this recycling of spent nuclear fuel. When this nuclear fuel comes out of the reactor, it's only using five to seven percent of its energy potential. And we have like eighty six thousand or you know, kilograms or whatever of, of metric tons of spent nuclear fuel you know, sitting in the United States that we're not using. And you have countries like Europe that are uh, reprocessing and they're, and they're reusing their spent nuclear fuel. We're throwing it in canisters and leaving it at the uh, nuclear reactors across the country. And that's a multi-billion dollar industry that we could be opening and creating high paying jobs, high paying technical jobs for a bunch of people and we're not doing it. And people don't wow. do it because there's a fear of nuclear Absolutely. energy generally. Yep. Maybe not after tonight. <laughs> we're changing yeah. hearts and minds over here. Not to nuclear diamonds. We just need to bring back that guy from the Biden administration, the like non-binary guy who kept stealing luggage. Maybe he can save the day. He'd, yeah, he'd wear a nuclear diamond ring yeah. and become a that superhero. That he took from someone's others. Yeah. Bag. Let's, uh, let, let's jump to this story. We've got a couple political uh, bits to jump on. We have the post millennial Trump blasts attempt to illegally remove his name from ballot in Colorado on phony insurrection claims. And ladies and gentlemen, we have received a, a, a spot in the books of history. At the trial for Donald Trump, over whether or not he should be allowed on the ballot, they played this clip, which I will play for you now, of a show you've probably seen with Cash Patel. Here we go. I have to wonder, Cash, if everything I said before about people being too stupid, it's in fact that the leadership is as stupid, right? Of course. The leadership is, no, no, the leadership is evil. They're not stupid. <laughs> There's a distinction. Yeah. I've worked with all of these people. They are pure evil. The only thing the Pelosi's and the Schumer's and the, and the like care about in the world is being glorified in the media. That's it. 
what's my next headline? What's my next payday? How do I scam the stock market with my husband? How do I come out on top and be Speaker of the House for more than basically a decade? That is the tract that people come in behind them on and saying, I want to be the next her. I want to be the next him. They are evil. That's the problem. The people that follow them? Yes, stupid. Yep, stupid. And they're evil. So that was played, that clip. It's funny because as soon as Cash said they're evil, I laughed with myself <laughs> laughing in the clip in the same way. I thought it was hilarious. And shout out to Phil Labonte for his cameo in the in the Trump trial. Uh, this is the current state of American politics. We have this uh, uh, this tweet here from Dean Phillips. He says, in one graph, this is why I'm running for president. We could be sleepwalking towards disaster. We need an open primary, and I hope other qualified Democrats still jump in. Here it is from Bloomberg News Morning Consult. Trump is leading in five of seven swing states and Michigan's a tie. So you've got in um, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Arizona, and Georgia. Trump is ahead in Michigan. It's tied in Nevada. Biden is leading in uh, all altogether. Trump is up by four points. So why are they trying to remove Trump from the ballot in Colorado? I think Colorado isn't one of these states. But they want to make sure that the popular vote count is as low as possible for Donald Trump. And they want to cripple him. They want to uh, exhaust his resources and force him into legal battles. The problem, however, is this is basically giving Trump a 24-7 rally. I like I get it. It's they're they're trying to stop him by any means necessary, but it's like a Chinese finger trap problem. They keep saying we're going to put him in court. And then, okay, now the media has got a camera in Trump's face again, letting him say whatever he wants. And it makes me think the people in Colorado whose tax dollars are being spent on this trial, right? Do they look at this and say, yes, this is our biggest priority? If you had told me they were doing something similar in like maybe 2016, right? When people were really, 2020, when people were really orange man bad, really freaking out about Trump, maybe I would have said, oh yeah, the average Coloradan feels like this is the most important news. But I don't feel that way, especially post COVID. And especially since, you know, Denver in particular has been really hard hit by uh, illegal immigration. There are a lot of issues that I'm sure people in Colorado would rather see their government focusing on. And instead, this is what they're being told their government's number one, the legal apparatus of their government's number one priority is right now. That would seem satisfactory for me. I don't know how you feel about it. No, I I agree. And I think what the American people are seeing is just a a spending spree by the Biden administration. To your point, you know, the, the average everyday American now is paying a lot more attention to what's going on politically. And I think. Trump once again resonates with the common American and, you know, the two tier justice system. The guy's been on trial since 2016 and, you know, you can only run it so many times without people paying some attention. And the more they, um, you know, the more they see it, the more drawn in they are. And I, I just think Trump has put on a master class on how to deal with the media. He's put on a master class on how to deal with these court systems. And he's very transparent and he speaks his mind. And I think pe- people appreciate it. I know I do. He's definitely weathered this, uh, I, I would say. I, I'm, There's I'm great just, words to describe it, but very impressively, I would say. Yeah. His mind is still very clear. I can hear the fatigue, but I mean, God, anyone going but, through this look, would be fatigued. I'm just at the Elmo meme phase in this one. You know, that the Elmo with fire rising up behind him. That's where I'm at with this. And I'm Tim's like, Halloween costume next year. <laughs> at this point, I, I really don't care what Trump says or does. I just despise these people so much that I just want Trump to go in and do whatever he wants because yep. it would be the most irritating thing in the world for them. And I know that's how people felt in 2016 and 2020. I didn't feel that way in 2016. I was like, ah, it's all stupid. But there were a lot of people who were looking at Donald Trump as this raging bull and they were laughing like, I hope this guy gets to do it, everyone. I'm at the point where I'm just like, I am so fed up with these trials, with these lies, the manipulation. I'm just like, can we get two or three Trumps? Can yeah. we get the whole Trump family? Can we get? Uh, I, 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 Where is Baron? Where is Baron? I got Baron? an idea. We're constantly trying to figure out who the VP is going to be. Trump, 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 <laughs> Trump. Just do it. I don't care which one it is. Can you run just with your son? Can Why you not? Ha- can your son be your just, vice president? Any one of them. Any one of them. As long as they're not from so the same funny. state. You know, Trump, Trump. But I don't think they are. Laura Trump. He's the only one in, in. Yeah. Well, she was North Carolina. I'd heard rumors yeah. that Lara, uh, or Laura Trump might seriously consider running in North Carolina because that's where she's from. She should be VP. Trump, That'd Trump. Be so interesting. Just more Trumps. All, I just want. I, I've just these awful people who exploit the system to enrich themselves through the stock market and all this awful garbage. And then we're watching them lie, cheat, and steal because the American people are finally like, guys, you ripped us off for long enough. 
All we're doing now is saying Trump's going to build some some border security and we're going to bring manufacturing back. None of these wars. And y'all couldn't even have it. Y'all got away with ripping us off for for generations, stealing these 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 ridiculous stock trading deals. They know what's going on. They're passing the laws. They're introducing them. They are lying, cheating and stealing. And all we ask is that some dude gets in for eight little old years and get some border security and bring some manufacturing back. And you said F you to all of us. And I'm just like, at this point, I just hope it's Trump 2024, 28, 32, 36, et cetera. Just, just never ending. What is it? I'm just, I'm just so done. Have you seen the Mel Gibson meme where it's like me voting for Trump in 2016 is just Mel Gibson smiling and me voting for no in 2020 and then me voting for Trump in, in 24. And it's got, you know, Mel Gibson with the brave heart. heart (laughs) (laughs) That's how the American people feel, man. What is it about Vivek? Do you guys, how do you feel about Vivek? And what I love him. I do too. I love him. Do you think he, like, do you throw your support behind him? Um, or would you, you pick Trump? Do you have a preference? Um, you know, my, my loyalties to, to Trump, I think he deserves another four years for all of the reasons we just said. Um, but, you know, Vivek, I met him a, a few years back when, you know, he wasn't running for politics. He spoke at a Lincoln Day dinner locally and uh, took a couple minutes of time to talk to me. And he's, he's a guy from Ohio. I think he's, uh, you know, the, the young, articulate, strong, um, American dream type of guy that we need. And he's he could be he could be VP. Great. I think that's what he's... He said he wouldn't take it. He he said he wouldn't, but he's probably the best person right now, realistically, in terms of positioning. I would, you know, it it, it is tough to figure out, like, who really would be the best VP? But Vivek, outside of him saying he doesn't want it, probably is best positioned for it. I know know his team is... is, is That's their focus, right? VP? Um, Yeah. I mean, I talked. I talked to his team. They're great people, right? But I mean, you know, the the long game for them. They're they're supporting Trump. I mean, Vivek is supporting Trump, right? He's never bashed him. But Vivek's also thirty eight. Yeah, and I think the reality. He knows he's not going to defeat Trump, right? And I think Vivek's uh, intention was to kneecap Ron DeSantis in the debates, and he did a hell of a job doing (laughs) it. Well, Ron did it to himself. I'm going to say, Ron, I wanted to love you, dude. You went on Patrick Bet David show. Where have you been? Come on, man. Just relax and sit down to, to, and to talk be, to us. It's easy. Take He's your in, shoes look, off. No, 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 Don't worry. On. He's the governor of Florida in Florida. Patrick Bet David's in Miami. It was like, I'm not going to, This I'll never do this, right? Jenk, you came on the Culture War podcast. I said, thank you. I know you host your own show. Taking time off from your show to do my show is a favor to me. I get it. Ron DeSantis is in Florida. It's easy for him to do PBD. Yeah, but you put in, what would it come to fly out here? You put in like eight tops, 18 hours of work. You're going to get 700,000 hours of product out of it from watch time. I got, I got to be honest. I got to be honest about this. You, I, I, Patrick Bet David is much more brutal than I am. He, he doesn't, he like, I, I give people leeway and some people argue I should not. Yeah. You know, a lot of people were saying that when Jen Kuker came on the show, I should have just gone at him way heavier. And they were like, why didn't it pop off? And I was like, I was trying to prevent it from getting into that heated debate. Well, and there were, there were a few points where we talked about George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery where Jen got really heated. And I, I, pulled away from it, trying to keep things down. Patrick Bed David, the way he went after Anthony Weiner, I mean, Ron had to know that PBD is not going to let him walk away from the high heel scandal in this way. I gotta be honest. If Ron came here, I would not drag him. I would have not. I would not have done. You that. wouldn't have had a a, a, a I would box not have of done Ferragamo that. shoes. Like, yep. like it was funny. It's a it's a clip. Obviously, his team had planned it. He, even the way he's like phrasing the like. I'm sure you, you've should. heard about this thing. Like, you know, this scandal about your shoes or whatever. Like, Patrick Davis knew what he was doing. He knew he was going to do it. With the second, you know, he got they, the sand disc. It, pre- it's a different style of show. It's not the way you operate. No one who comes on the show will ever be ambushed like that. And I, I mean, no, no disrespect to PBD. I think it was masterfully done. And I, I, he's pointing out great criticism, but that's just not how we w- we do things. And I'm a big fan of, of the work that he does. I think he's a genius. But it's funny to me seeing that. I'm like, the DeSantis people are are banned from coming on this show. But by, they would by their choose, own team. By their own team. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want them on. We want DeSantis and, and, and his people to come on, but they've, they, they've refused. They've told their staff they're not allowed. And then he decided to go on Valuetainment instead, where it's like, yo, that's the frying pan, man. Mm-hmm. That's like... PBD is not going to. Yeah, it's an example of the poor team that Ron DeSantis oh, has around him. And he's, he's in a, he's in an echo chamber, right? I've met Ron DeSantis before. I liked him before the election. Man, I was just thinking like this guy. You know, if he would have done what Reagan, you know, um, did to uh, Barry Goldwater, right? He could have he could have passed the torch or not passed the torch, but he could have had the torch passed to him on the back end, right? And he didn't do that. And I think everything about his campaign is a shining example of the consultant class ruining politics. 
the guy has been in an echo chamber his entire campaign. You can see when he steps out because when he steps out, that's when he's you know out of his zone and he makes you know a lot of mistakes. But man, dude, only if right? I mean, he would have been the perfect guy in twenty twenty eight, but now it's too late. No, you know what I really do think. I know I've said it several times in the past couple of weeks, but I think the the donors went to Ron yep. and convinced him to run to make sure he would not be VP. A Trump DeSantis ticket is unbeatable, and that's what everyone had been saying the year mm -hmm. before. The, uh, you know, I've talked about I'll talk. I, you know, I'm talking to a guy. I'm, I'm hanging out at MGM National Harbor, and there's a guy. He's like, I hate Trump. Oh, but I can't vote for Biden. And I'm like, what about DeSantis? He's like, oh yeah, I'd vote for DeSantis for sure. And then I say, what if it's Trump DeSantis, Trump President Dance VP? And he goes. Yeah, I'd vote for it. He's like, with DeSantis there, I think I could do it. And I think the establishment saw the writing on the wall that Ron is willing to play ball with whatever's going to get him the victory. So in Florida, he's going along with 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 core right culture war talking points and he's putting his policies forward. And they're like, uh oh, that means that if he teams up with Trump, he's going to just say yes, sir, to Trump. And he's going to go along with this to try Good and be point. successful and build and build a career up. So they go to Ron and they say, no, no, you should be president. You should run. And they're laughing at him behind the scenes. They're like, this guy's an idiot. He's actually going to do it. He thinks he's going to go up against Trump. Oh, I got an idea. Tell him to wear high heels. <laughs> Tell him to wear high heels. And then don't show him the videos and then send him to PBD on purpose. This is the point. Jen Uger comes on this show. I basically let him speak. We have a little bit of disagreements and arguments, but there's a lot of stuff I could have brought up that we didn't bring up because I'm like, I'm trying to actually talk about solutions and keep things tame and calm. Patrick Bet David is 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 le he's he's much more direct. He's a lot stronger on these things than I am with his point of view. Anybody who knows about his past interviews knows he's going. He's not going to let you walk on this one. He's not going to give you the same leeway that that I might. I think they sabotage him on purpose. They 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 brought him to a show and gave and 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 gave Valuetainment a layup to put a pair of boots on a table. Oh come on! Yeah. Here we are, friends with some of the people who worked for DeSantis in his campaign. And they they can't even come on the show. And I'm like, that's wow. weird, man. Why? We talked to him. We'd actually help. Like, hey, let's work through these issues that you're having and figure out ways you can improve. Nah, they won't do it. Yeah, I'd, I'd take the boot, cut it open on air with a knife and show you, yeah, it's a cowboy boot. And it's probably Bro. his toes aren't long enough, so it looked like it was bending. Bro, it's still no. a cowboy boot. No. You think yeah. he's wearing he, he, like it's, it's, it's inserts? Because some fact. some cowboy I, boots I, just have big heels. It's my, a fact. On my Twitter, I posted a picture of me standing next to Ron DeSantis and, and a picture of me standing next to Trump and then Trump standing next to DeSantis. And in all three pictures, Ron DeSantis' height has fluctuated. And I don't wear and not just I don't that wear boosters or there's when you watch videos of him walking, he's very obviously one the way he's walking high heels and two when the foot bends, you can tell that. Mm -hmm. He's wearing high heels. Yep. I someone went to him and said, "Put the high heels on. You'll look tall." And everyone and, and they're laughing at him like, "I can't believe this idiot's doing it." And he won't fire these people because they are sabotaging him on purpose. And this now again, the Trump DeSantis ticket a year and a half ago was unbeatable. Absolutely, they'd be Trump if Trump announced DeSantis would be the VP. He'd be pulling at fifty two percent or something. Honestly, if if DeSantis just bowed down and had humility right now, they'd still be unbeatable. If you saw him acknowledge the the I don't want to swear on camera, but the some... last year of his campaign, if he acknowledged how poorly run it was, people would light up. I think that there's uh, too much animosity right now for uh, a Trump DeSantis ticket. And I think part of that has to do with the infrastructures they're both surrounded by, because you would need to merge their teams or one of them would have like DeSantis would have to abandon everyone he's been working with. I, 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 I don't know that that's realistically going to happen. Maybe what? it should. So I don't want to force anyone into drama. But why is it that there have been three people who have come on this show who have asked me, why am I being attacked by DeSantis' campaign? And, and, and so there are individuals who are not hyper-partisan electoral personalities that have, they, they don't, individuals whose careers do not put them in the line of, I'm for Trump or I'm for DeSantis. We've had people on the show who are not saying either of those things. And they're like, DeSantis' campaign started attacking me. And I'm like, yeah, they're trying to destroy his campaign. They want to make, they're going scorched earth. They want to make sure that if in six months, it clearly is Trump, there will not be a recovery period like Ted Cruz had. Ted Cruz was lying Ted. And then after the primary, he was lying, rawr, Ted. Lying instead good. of lying. That's pretty good That's insight. the recovery. That's pretty good insight. And, 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 and you he grew his sadness beard. That was the time. <laughs> well, I can speak to that too, right? Look what, uh, you know, 
when when this first all started, I, I wasn't uh, negative on DeSantis at all. I, and, and I'm known to be a Trump supporter, right? But then you had J.D. Vance come out and say, you know, leave it to Ron DeSantis' poorly run team to attack their former friends, right? And that's exactly what they've done. But, but see, the thing is, they attacked people who were currently their yeah, friends. Yeah, yeah. I, like I've had people, prominent individuals say to me, I, they like ask me like, Hey, uh, do, do you know what's going Like I'm being attacked by the Santa's people. Do you know why? And I'm like, I'm like, I, they are attacking everybody. And it's just, they're just like, I, I don't understand. Like I've not said anything bad about them at all. Right. And that I'm, I just, I think the idea is after the primary, they want to make sure that not a single Trump supporter will welcome DeSantis back. Yeah. There's no explanation for why some of these personalities are prominent individuals with a lot of followers. There's no explanation for why they're like, I can't stand DeSantis. You know, I'm, I'm, why would you attack some of these people? Why did they start attacking us? Why yeah. did they ban their people from coming on the show? If when Ron loses, there's a recovery period where Trump can say enough fighting. You know, Ron's a great governor and we're going to welcome him back. Not anymore. There's not. No, he's going to be Rosie O'Donnell. It, yeah, exactly. It is so toxic. And... The high heels thing yeah. was the nail in the coffin. Yep. Think, There's no way Trump can be like, I'm going to choose backstabbing high heel Ron with the crackhead PR team. It's it's not it's not going to happen. There's the, a reason why they don't work for Trump anymore and they deflect it over to his team. I mean, yep. uh, DeSantis' crew? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, he has I, some smart people on his team, but to I don't, Tim's I, point, I don't think so. They're, 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 okay. not, they're not around anymore, though. They may be well, no. Maybe they're just not wise. They're no, not no, 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 no. We'll two, two, two potentials. DeSantis' people are geniuses, and what they're doing is intentionally destroying DeSantis, or they are the stupidest people in the world, and they don't understand they're destroying DeSantis. I think they have. Additionally, no matter how you cut it, Ron DeSantis is the dumbest politician in the country right now. For hiring them. But it's like a, for, it's for, like for a lack of- For not firing yeah, them. Absolutely. Look, look, you can, you can hire bad people, but after the first screw-up, you have a talking to. After the second screw-up, you start saying, warning, and you put out statements. Third screw-up, you say, I have removed this person from my staff. He's not done it. Especially when your platform is built on the, you know, the the preface that you run a tighter ship than Trump, right? Trump had all these leaks in the White House, according to DeSantis, and he runs a tight ship in Florida, right? It just, it's a, it's a, it's a direct uh, polar, it, it's, it's polar to what he, what he's campaigned on. Yeah, I get the vibe. It, okay, what I was going to say is, I think, the, I, Ron strikes me as high intelligence, low wisdom, because he doesn't know how to get his intellect across it's poorly managed and poorly integrated and like you got to have humility dude and this this obsession with pride of like oh they said something mean get them like no you got to like roll with it yeah you said something yeah, mean because i'm a goofball that's, sometimes that's his team yeah, yeah. see i it's like bled into I, like I, his no, persona unfortunately it, it, you're, you're right i like ron DeSantis. i think he's done the best job of any governor in florida and that's why so many people move there that's why a lot of people are defensive of him but that is it that is no excuse for hiring the worst people imaginable who are setting fires to everything around you and you being like, this is fine. At that point, I'm like, this guy has a very serious leadership problem. Very serious leadership. And I'm, you know what I'm going to start doing? Sorry. I can only assume now the accomplishments of Florida are due to the legislature and he's just going, true, I guess. And he's, he's bumbling around like Mr. Magoo. Because where he has direct ex executive authority, his campaign, he's failed miserably. When it comes to the politics of Florida, He's stamping what the Florida legislature passes. And so we give him a lot of credit for it and for standing up and making statements. Now I'm just thinking, you know, they're probably just handing him a script and he just says whatever. And in Florida, they want to win. They do. But here they're trying to tank him knowing he can't beat Trump and they don't want him teaming up with Trump. So they're sabotaging him or they want him to stay governor of Florida and they don't want him to be president. So they're trying to destroy his chances. I don't know. That's a possibility. It's, not, it's not a great. Uh, any of these options are pretty bad to have on your staff, right? I mean. This is not what you would want to be surrounded by while running a campaign. Yeah, I mean, but the establishment, to Tim's point, is evil, and they'll, you know, they'll go to the farthest lengths to destroy something that they don't like. And well, people were pointing out, like Ken Griffin donating to DeSantis, and the immediate assumption is the establishment is teaming up with DeSantis to go against Trump, and I'm kind of like, or they just are sabotaging DeSantis. Yeah. <laughs> they do not want an ascendant Trump personality. They don't want an heir to the Trump throne. If what was everybody saying? Trump 2024, DeSantis VP, DeSantis 2028. Not anymore, they're not. DeSantis is done. I mean, I don't know where he goes after this. He's he's termed out of Florida. Maybe he'll run for the Senate. So question then, VP Ramaswamy or Kennedy? Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy. I personally want Larry Elder to be VP. I've got a job oh. writing on it. So, you know. I like Byron Donalds, to be honest. Yeah. Byron's a he's good awesome. guy. I love Byron. Byron's um, excellent. He's a really cool dude. Yeah, stand up guy. He's endorsed my campaign, by the way. Um, 
But yeah, Byron Donald is is one of the best people I met in DC. I agree, absolutely one of the best people. I, I met. mean, there's there's so few people, but I actually met Byron Donalds when he was hanging out with Matt Gates, and I'm like, I'm not surprised. Yeah, like these are good dudes. Lauren yeah. Bobert's office, we interviewed him. It was really. Do you cool. think that there's any weight to the idea that Trump's going to feel obligated to pick a female VP? Oh, he better not play this game. No. That's what I do not want him to play this Nikki game, Haley. but I keep hearing everywhere, no, it's definitely going to be a woman. It's definitely going to be a woman. And I do not want that. It, should, it makes me really mad. I be think, sure to tell him that. I yeah. Think, I, I, as soon as he calls me, I'll be like, if you put, pick a woman BVPV, you've lost everyone's confidence. We got to, you know, you know, like people kept asking us when we're having him on the show and we know so many people in Trump circle, they've all said like, we can figure something out. We'll talk to him. He's, he'll probably just say yes, of course, but we got to go to him. And we just, we've not coordinated it and tried to make it happen. I'm not saying Trump is going to give us the time of day. I'm saying, you know, a lot of people around him are like, no, no, yeah, we can, we can work with him and, and, and schedule something. We've just not done it. We should probably just finally do it yeah. and just get our, like, booking people to be like, can we just arrange this finally? Because then I can say, you know, Don, just don't, no, 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 no Nikki Haley. Like, <laughs> just, yeah, I think yeah. that should let me Let me ask you. I, I think, you know, what I've learned in politics is things kind of uh, are placated right on purpose. I think maybe that was something that leaked on the back end to just test the waters for what the general public would think and what Twitter would think. And I think pretty quickly it got, uh, you know, smoshed that, you know, he, he needed to have a, a female vice president. And the, I, I look, think he's I think he's turned the page on that. I don't think Vivek is the perfect candidate. I think he's the current best option. You know, in the past, I said, Kerry Lake. But, you know, there were several points that were made. One, in terms of what is best for Carrie Lake, yeah. running for Senate, winning in Arizona, and helping fix the states. We got to win at the state. We got we to win, win, win the states. Um, but also, some other people pointed out, then you have Trump and Trump, basically. Carrie Lake yeah. is a smart, like, no disrespect to Trump, but she is a, 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 a sharper, articulate Trump. And so people have said, you need a contrast to that. And Vivek, in a way, is kind of like Trump, but... He's a PR guy. He is tactful, kind of like how Kerry Lake is. But I'm, 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 in terms of his presence, that's why I kind of feel like he's probably the better option. Sometimes I want it to be a VP that is not currently seeking the presidency. You know, I know that's pretty normal to to consider. You know, this is how we got uh, Kamala Harris, of course. But and Pence. I think yeah, that Pence there, wasn't running, right? Pence no. wasn't running. Yeah. And, and again, like not no. that Pence was necessarily that was the best option. Pence was forced by uh, the establishment, man. I mean, that's that's given. But I don't yeah. like it becoming too much of a of a manufacturing line, right? It's like, well, if you drop out early enough, I'll give you a VP. I like the idea that there is potentially other perspectives out there that yeah, we but don't hear on the national I think stage. Vivek, I think Vivek compliments Trump in the fact that they have two totally different leadership styles. I mean, Trump's a transformational type guy, right? He sees the big picture. Uh, Vivek tends to get in the details. And, you know, it, they... they um, they're polar opposites in so many regards, but personality-wise, they do have some similarities. Yeah, they're both executors. I but Trump has the is the executor, sure. and Ramaswamy's the mastermind. Yeah, they're both masterminds, but Ramaswamy is a pure mastermind. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's what he said when he was here. He was saying, you know, some personalities just can't mesh well together, and I am a personality. I've been an executive for so long. Like I have to be at the front, and I think it might be a challenge to be VP under someone else. It's not that he's not talented and could do amazing things. It's just it's just hard for me to imagine a Trump Ram Ramaswamy ticket where they're both happy at the I, end. I of it. think it's he yeah. has a duty to the country. I think we all do. And if he's called to the position, he has to take it. Trump can persuade him. I mean, you know that that that's the that's the beauty of the guy. You know, you sit down with him. And I get it, right? So certain personalities clash, but if it's not you know obvious that those two could work in cohesion i mean just someone who understands leadership theory at a basic minimum can tell that these two guys can work together because they balance one another i'm just kind of thinking like who else could it be seriously i mean well, kennedy that's why I like but Byron, i don't though that's no, why i don't I like think it'd be kennedy. kennedy now kennedy to your point that's where i think there would be a personality clash because i don't think kennedy's going to take the back seat and really? where you have a guy like Byron, who is also technically intelligent, right, with his finance background. I mean, there's another balance to Trump. So, I mean, you have to kind of look for that personality, uh, subtle differences, but differences that complement. I think I think Byron maybe in a couple cycles would. It, it's tough. I don't see him as a VP right now. Byron is he, Donald's. Is he running? Uh, is he running for? No, he doesn't have any aspirations. 
I, yeah, I we should have him on the show. We we only interviewed we him for like fifteen <laughs> minutes. He was only on for like ten or fifteen Make minutes. Make sure Larry comes with him. His buddy, his buddy Larry, his his advisor. Those two together are <laughs> it's hilarious, man. They're great. I would love to talk to Byron for a couple hours. Vivek it's seems really cool. like he could be VP right now. Yeah. But again, I don't think he's the perfect candidate. It's just I don't know who else there is unless it was Trump. Trump which I don't think would be realistic as much as I jokingly say, let's just get as many Trumps in federal office and as possible. Let's just, you know, what, how, how old is, is Barron? Can he run for Congress? Yeah, he's got to be 25. Ba- he's not old Barron enough. Barron Trump, he yeah. hasn't graduated high school yet. Ah. I mean, he's, he's got a minute. I think he I'll make an exception to put more Trumps in, in, in government. You just, it, just get them all in there because it pisses you know, off. We're gonna get, he runs we're gonna for get class get president. It. Then he will run. <laughs> He's 17. We're going to get accused of uh, He'll be you know, 17. promoting oligarchy on the show. Right? But I, I don't care. You made Trump a good royal point. family because it pisses off the machine. <laughs> and then we'll we'll figure out. It's, it's like the Simpsons when, you know, when they had the, the, the what did they have? The lizard problem. And so they were like, they'll get dogs. And then how do you do with the dogs? And then they're like, we'll get, you know, they, they increase, keep getting the animals bigger and bigger until they're finally like, we'll have gorillas go and kill the animal. And, and they're like, <laughs> but then they have a gorilla problem. And Skinner's, I think it was Skinner. He's like, no, that's the best part. When winter comes, they simply freeze to death. So it's just like, we'll get all the Trumps in there. Let them just, just Trump it out. Trump it out, man. And then, you know, we'll figure it out later. I thought you made a good point that Ramaswamy is not the perfect candidate because I think a lot of people might right now be looking for perfection. And if they don't see it, they're going to turn away and vote for what they think is safe. But you're never going to find perfection. You've got to go with, you got to take risks. Well, and we're, to, to, to counter that, though, if you look at some of the folks that are anti-Vivek, that are in like MAGA, you know, in the MAGA mindset, right? They're they're attacking Vivek because they believe he's too perfect. They think he's Obama 2.0. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of different theories on that. But at the end of the day, like it's it's deeds, not words. Right. And if you look at what Vivek has done for his personal life, for his family, you know, for the state he lives in, in his community. I mean, you don't have any Vivek Ramaswamy employees Viv- jumping out saying this guy's a terrible leader. Vivek effectively said he wants to cut funding to Israel. Now, not as blunt. He says he wants to get them sustainable to the point through U.S. support to where we don't need to be supporting them anymore. Which is the intelligent way of saying like, hey, we should not be. That's bold because, it's, you know, Nikki Haley is like, ah, and she loses her mind. My objection to Ronald Swamini, to be honest, is, you know, again, I, I'm very lucky to be in a position to have to ask him this. But he has he has a more flexible view on HB1, H1B visas than I do. Uh, I, I feel like I would prefer someone to take a stronger stance on border and border security and and reducing even legal immigra- legal immigration into the country as well as illegal immigration. But that is not to say that he couldn't do amazing things i am not convinced this is the cycle i don't think he would like being vp to trump but he has incredible potential and i think it's better to have a a a deep bench of people who can do good things for the country even like we always talk about it like it's just the presidency and the vp but it's really not there are tons of cabinet positions there are lots of things that we could have talented intellectual and accomplished people uh, step into and really benefit the american public i get the uh the Obama criticism, they, they, they feel like Vivek is Obama 2.0. I've thought that a couple of times. I've even said it on the show, Vivek the snake, I called him a couple of times. And it's like, I feel that like he's an order. He's willing to bend with the wind like a reed, even to the point maybe where he'll snap like Obama did. And then the big business takes over. But that's why I like seeing him in the VP position, because he'll watch it happen all around him and he won't have to be the one getting co-opted. And he'll see how Don like kind of came think that's out unscathed he, I mean, the first that's time. What he communicated to us. He didn't want to be... And I would the, the, I, someone watching, he wants to be at the head of the organization. And so, again, like maybe if, you know, he doesn't progress with the presidential race, maybe he should run for governor of Ohio. Maybe he should step into a leadership role on a smaller scale. And then, you know, he's so young. He has so much potential to do a lot of things. If he doesn't run this cycle, I'm sure he'll run again. Who do the Democrats have in terms of youth? AOC? <laughs> And like Max Frost, that's like the guy yeah. they're always talking about. He's like Just the youngest member progressive. of Congress. Gavin Newsom. Yeah, but Max Frost, you said? Yeah, I, per- that's, I think that's his name. Oh, yeah. he's, Out of Florida. He, he's not the same level of AOC and no, Vivek. No, not yet. I think v- they're v- go- Vivek like stepped onto the stage and hit it out of the ballpark and, and skyrocketed in terms of uh, just like notoriety, notability. You know, the things he was saying, the conversations he was having, the way he was having them inspired a lot of people very, very quickly and resulted in this viral like notability yeah the guys loved in ohio like i said man i met him before he even had political aspirations he was just coming around talking about i mean he was he was a libertarian you know he said it some and, some people are arguing uh, have made the claim that he wants to be a senator out of ohio i think he's denied that yeah i mean there's been people advocating for it you know because of the senate race in ohio right now is is highly contested so you know i think vivek standing out the way he has 
during his presidential run has drawn a lot of, a lot more attention to him. When uh when Gavin Newsom went over to China, I got the vibe like, oh, they're running Gavin Newsom. Oh, That's what's going to sure. happen. So I, I yep. now I still Michelle think Obama or Gavin Newsom. That should be, I, I I just I can't identify with Democrats at all because if I were like this guy wants to be the president, so he went to China and that's how I know he wants to be yeah. the president. Like no no no, tour the U.S., leave California and come see you know industrial towns in the Midwest that were devastated by manufacturing leaving. Go to West Virginia and talk to people who are affected by the opioid crisis. Like if you want to be president of the United States, shouldn't you talk to Americans? Why would you be like, I will go overseas. This is a great idea. Like, yeah. I just, I can't relate to it. Go spank little boys while I'm playing basketball. I've never seen a governor go speak with the pre president of China before. Have you? I've never yeah. seen that before. It's so, weird, huh? Yeah. That was highly uh, unique. Unorthodox. Yeah. <laughs> Novel. Well, you know, the great nation of California needs representation I, in China. I, I don't see Biden being the nominee. I don't see him being the candidate for the Democrats. Yeah. Because look at the polls right now. Cenk Uger said he's only running basically to bring awareness to that, the fact that Biden's going to lose. And that he's, he's like, what? I have to run because people don't understand Biden will lose. He bought the domain Biden is going to lose dot com. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> like, and he said Republicans should want Biden in the race. And I'm like, I agree. Quick, us, <laughs> yes. Well, and then and then um, Dean Phillips out of Minnesota launched his campaign to challenge Biden after right. pretending he wasn't going to for a minute. I yeah, mean, he's to the tweet we pulled up. It's it's kind of interesting that we're we have a an open Democrat who's like, I'm I'm I think I can maybe run a race. Uh, I I had thought when RFK decided to run as an independent, perhaps there was pressure from the DNC being like, you have to get out of here. We can't have anyone else. But obviously that message hasn't hasn't trickled down to the rest of the rank and file if we have someone out of Minnesota saying, well, I might throw my hat in the ring after we've already have an independent candidate challenging essentially Biden. I know they pretend like it's both Trump, Trump and Biden. It's really not. I mean, no one wants Biden to run. This yeah. is what's happening. I was, uh, I didn't, I wasn't here when Chank was on the show uh, because I was in Miami. But I was thinking about progressivism. That's a term that gets thrown. Out. I'm progressive. Think about progressivism, and I'd love to talk to Chank to talk to you about this directly too, Chank. Progress means to move forward, so you can progress towards a cliff and then walk <laughs> off the cliff. Where yes. are you progressing? That's a big part of being progressive. What are you progressing to? And also, how are you progressing? Are you progressing as a wild mob, disorganized, or are you progressing in an organized fashion? They're so, they're they're walk, marching towards the cliff. And we need to, we need to, They're that needs to be discussed, to debated, there. and observed because we're, that's a big part okay. of it. You can't just say you're progressive and, and it expects So you don't want to be regressive, but unless. Well, it depends. If you're about to walk off a cliff, you do want to be right. regressive. Or maybe you want to turn left. What's the, what's or trans, right. or right. What's transgressive? You know what transgressive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're the transgressive. Is, is that, that the right word? Yeah, that's one of them. Transgressive. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't want to go forward. The forward is the cliff. We don't want to go backwards. That's too far. But we want to go kind of back and to the left. You know, we should go back a little bit because the left has gone nuts. But we mostly just want to turn left. Maybe degressive. Or turn right. I want to go back and to the right. I was going to say, I will, to I will right, only the join this movement, the transgressive movement, if we're going back into the right. Transgressive. Uh, I, I'm into the transgressive movement then. But I, back into the left sounds equally as bad because ultimately it'll be like, why are we going back? We Keep, should go forward again. But, and it'll just horseshoe back to where it was going. We do have the 20s in the chat for what Ian had said, because it is correct. The The left seems to be progressive for the sake of progress, but progress for the sake of progress is blind. They're just saying, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Why not? Why not? And you're like, eventually you're like, hey, there's a naked man dancing in front of children. And they're like, progress. And you're like, OK, but this is not what we thought we were progressing to. Transgress. We want Star Trek yeah. and like you know, replicators and cold and that fusion graphene stuff? and graphene, not naked men dancing for children. OK, that's right. not progress. That's something weird. Actually, I think that's transgressive. Amen, brother. <laughs> Amen, sister. That's what I meant. No, I think I, I think progress in the in the relative sense, like what would Americans view as progress? It would be space travel, uh, you know, uh, um, colonizing other planets. When you ask someone, what do you think the future looks like? These are the things they, they they envision. They envision, oh, people aren't hungry anymore. People aren't starving. Food replicators, spaceships. That's what they think of when they think of us advancing and progressing. What's happened is the left has hijacked progress. And now they've got naked dudes dancing in front of children. And yeah. I'm like, okay, that's that's like veering off the course. Yeah. So, so we're driving. Here's a better way to put it. We're driving on this road. And you've got a rocky cliffside to your right and a sheer cliff cliffside straight drop to your left and they've they've turned the car to the left and we're like guys if we keep keep this angle up we're going off the edge we got to correct it and go back to the 
the the dreams of the, of what we used to focus on for a moment let us congress meaning move together and turn around and then we'll go to space That's but funny. now so we define where we're going very clearly paint the picture chank and everyone that wants to be progressive or consider himself paint the picture of where you want to end up i like this word grass yes for, for currently we should egress <laughs> yes we should. <laughs> we're about to egress the super chats but also after you explain where we're going and you you outline it in such a vivid way that people can picture it then explain how we're going to get there piece by piece and you'll have a lot of people following you yeah see the left is mostly just we should just do what we do for whatever reason which is the military war machine from 1913 federal reserve banking yeah it's the never enough party right they say you know we've accomplished this progressive goal but now we have to push it and we don't, there there's no there's no reason why it's just continuing to push boundaries forward and forward and i think that allows people with really nefarious agendas to step in and say i'm benefiting from this kind of this this dissolve into chaos mm -hmm. because it's we're anarchy. constantly it's anarchy had, you know disguised as, as progressivism in, in so many different ways i mean I mean, true progressivism, like like you're explaining, I mean, is realistic. It has reasonable goals, and you you know where you're going with them. I mean, it's just total destruction. That's what transgressive means, actually. It means just violate the social norms or regular norms that we're doing. So they're really, in reality, they are transgressive because that's the definition of the word. They're not progressing towards anything that's meaningful, and the goalposts are always moving, too. Yeah. So trans goalposts every day. Transgressive so. is like swerving the wheel left and right as you're going. I mean, like stop it. Oh, Serge has got the details. Yeah, it's like it has to do with like breaking social boundaries or moral boundaries. Yeah, so transgressive would be to like end like revolting against moral and social boundaries, which is literally what the progressive movement today is saying that they're doing. So creating generations. Oh, of oh, yeah. Trans transgressive in is involving a violation of moral or social boundaries. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that's what I was saying. Like they're literally are transgressive because they always tell me is that they're, that they're trying to do is like you know. Yeah subvert the thing so it's not it's like you're not progressive progressive is the wrong word and i don't know they're transgressive transgressive like yeah they're not progressive they're trans and arguably aggressive yeah, unfortunately. very aggressive <laughs> very extremely aggressive. aggressive ian has uh, just now stated every word using the using the base grass and if you have yet to ingress <laughs> do it it's in prayer you'll you'll go within yourself feel god's energy you should write a song that we use all these grass words grass on gresser yes <laughs> i guess <The> <laughs> Okay, how about we uh, pop over to Super Chats? I'm so happy. We progress over to Don't Super Don't be chats? grassy. No, we <laughs> ingress? Yeah, we are. All right, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, head over to TimCast.com, click join us, become a member, because that members only uncensored show is coming up in about a half an hour. And you don't want to miss it, because you as a member, you can call into the show and actually talk to us. All right, where are we at? Blave Kaiser says, always remember Biden's last action in Afghanistan was to drone strike a father and his seven kids while he was delivering water to his neighborhood. That's great. Uh, just 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 good work on that one, uh, Joey Boy. Nice. Was that before or after he issued the surrender? Man. That was probably uh, after. Alpha Turkey says, hey, Tim, it's unfair for you to call Gen Z lazy for not wanting to get out of bed to work when your generation didn't have to deal with the possibility of a Disney executive under your bed. It's a fair point. Hmm. Kathleen Kennedy was not under my bed. Hmm. That's a reference to South Park, by the way. <laughs> Carmen's like, Mom, can you check so, to see yeah. if Kathleen Kennedy's under my bed? And then uh, I don't want to spoil the rest <laughs> for you. No, but I think um, I think millennials are lazier than Gen Z. I think it's important to say, you know, I, I, I want to make sure I have this. I say this quite a bit. Gen Z actually is, I think, in many ways based and millennials suck. I think a lot of it is that they aren't incentivized. And so there is no, mom the, the momentum's not there. It's just, it, they, they wake up to this, like, what's the point kind of thing that I didn't get in the 90s and the 80s. I was like, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be famous, make a bunch of money and save the world. Yeah. I think a lot of millennials were trained to just wait for instructions, you know? And so yeah. now that's what happens. Exactly. They're just waiting for someone to tell them what they're supposed to be and, doing. And they're frustrated because they're not satisfied with that, that way of living. And what happens with Gen Z is they catch the beginning of the influencer age in which you have to build your own platform. So millennials yeah, were like, so tell me what to do, mom and dad, tell me what to do, teacher, tell me what to do, professor. And that's their whole life. And they get a, got a college, get out of college and they're like, government, please govern me harder, daddy. Whereas Gen Z are in this period where tons of people are self-made, young people yeah. are self-made millionaires. And they're like, I gotta, I gotta hustle and I gotta make a page and I gotta do these influencer stuff. Now, not all that is good, but I think that creates a little bit more of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and independent spirit among Gen Z. Don't 
don't get me wrong, there are a lot of communists in Gen Z. I wonder if that's natural generational that you you breed generations of workers and then generations of leaders that then build businesses for the workers. It reminds me them. of uh, nature versus nurture is what it is. See, it reminds me of like year of the I don't remember what it's called in China. I guess the zodiacs, but like Zodiac, the yeah. year of the is it the dragon is the year that everyone wants to have a kid. There's one year mm -hmm. where a lot of people are like, this is this is the best thing ever. And I was listening to some report from NPR where it's like the children who are born in this desirable year actually do perform better on tests. They do tend to have higher education, you know, things like that, these mm -hmm. metrics. But that's because they're dragons. And well, and that's the thing. Are, is it because they are told constantly, you're successful, you're special? Both. Or is it because people just say, oh, yes, the dragon, like, that is very important. You must, you must stand out. So I, I think, think I'm they're a literally I think dragons, I'm a tiger. personally. You think they're literally dragons? Yeah, I'm a monkey. I'm, you're, you're the monkey. I think I'm a tiger. Nice. I don't know what tiger. I that was my high school cool. animal, the tigers, the false tigers. Nice. Tiger Falls, what's up? I don't know what I am. Somebody sh wow. tell me. I'm April 2nd, 1979. It, it's per year, so whatever 79 would be. So I'm 92, so I'm a monkey. Chinese? Yeah, Chinese. Yeah, 1986, tiger. Tiger. And it means each of these years come with different attributes. I mean, I find this yeah, really yeah, interesting, yeah. right? I'm the goat. Go, hey, well, well, what's up? Are you really no here? joke. You're 79? Confirmed. I'm 79, man. What's up, goat? Yeah, but nice. Jeremy You're also goat a goat? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's what I'm talking about. The goats. Represent. Goat What's it? What's yours, Hannah Claire? I think I'm the pig or something. What, what year? year? Ninety five. Uh, I have no idea what it is. Ninety five the is the uh, Gen the, X, the blind mole rat. Well, that's fun. <laughs> you are the pig. Yeah, Thank you're you. a, you're, you're a pig. Oh, I was nice. gonna make a Kim Possible <laughs> reference. I didn't know if any of the boys in this room would uh, get yeah, it. I know. Thank oh, you, sir. Man, sometimes translated as the boar. Yeah, that's me. I'm a boar. Ninety three is the rooster. Dude, nice. the roosters are cool. Yeah, the, the roosters, roosters are based. Dude. We got um, all the rooster boys. We got too many. So we created an outside area. So it's outside of Chicken City. It's not the Chicken City suburbs. And we've nice. it's the area that's fenced <laughs> off. And we, there's a little house. There's like a little a little makeshift house so they can go in there and be safe from the wind. And there's like 12 roosters. And they're just outside exposed, not going in. They're just so dumb. And they've just huddled together for warmth. And I'm like, guys, go in your little shelter. And they just, they they're don't like, do stop it. Stop telling me what to do. But I'm an independent chicken. I rallied them earlier. I rallied them for those that were listening to Chicken City uh, at chickencity.com. I think chickencitylive.com. I rallied them and, and made sure they knew that these young men, these brave men are the front line to protect the city of, uh, of Chicken City from predators, raccoons and foxes. They got to get through these these brave roosters before they could make it into the city where the civilians are at. Wow. A rousing speech. That's right. Rally That's right. Put, One year in the future. The struggle. All right. Steven says, congratulations at Blave Kaiser. You are first. That's right. He was first. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, Tim, look at you out here making the January 6th hearing and now Trump's trial. Before you know it, you'll be on trial yourself. Shout out <laughs> Phil's cameo. <laughs> yep. You know, it's kind of a weird thing. Like, I didn't start doing this so that clips of me would end up at January 6th hearings or in Trump's ballot hearing trial. But it is going to be hilarious in like 100 years. And they're like, kids, open up the archive and let's watch a clip from Timcast IRL, a political show, and we'll learn about the politics of the era. And then it's like, I don't know, me and Ian saying stupid nonsense things and making jokes about fat pigs and like, <laughs> It'll be like insulting Liz Cheney. When President Poole was a child, he started <laughs> yeah, a right. building computers at the age of 12. It'll be funny because it's like, the, there's so much advertising. You know, I wonder anyone else like who was in the courtroom that day or whatever, if they're going to be like, I never heard of this show. It's kind of interesting. Tim Cass, like yeah. how many listeners do we have tonight like, who are like, in the courtroom? All the news articles are right about it. No, yeah. In the future, they're not going to mention President Poole. They're going to be talking in class about, you know, former presidents appearing on the show. And then one student's going to be like, how come we don't hear about Tim Poole in any other history books? I'm like, ah, oh, that's because shortly after this, he got into a van and went to live down by the river. <laughs> that's how it'll, that's how it'll turn <laughs> out. Nikola like Tesla. the avatar. Yeah, you know, when we needed van. him most, he was gone. That's right. Chicken yeah. City. For a hundred years. Yeah, where I envision myself ending up is like an old 65-year-old man on the top of a mountain with a bunch of chickens and, you know, a nice little uh, RV or something to live in, self-sustainable uh -huh. self and, you know, a pointy stick. And when someone shows up being like, we'd like to talk to you, get off my property, get away from me, you <laughs> crazy people, I don't want to have anything to do with you, leave me alone. And they'll be like, wow, this guy went crazy. It's like, yes, he did. Uh, all right, where are we at? Voice of the People says, since they played that clip of you and Cash Patel in court, does this mean everyone must be removed from trial? Remember Juror 77? They're all far-right extremists now. That's right. Yeah, Juror 77, remember that in, in uh, Trump's case? He had once seen an episode of Timcast 
And therefore, they said he's biased. Got to go. Well, now, clearly, after that, uh, everyone in that trial saw that clip of me. Of course, they're fans. Does this mean that I will never have to serve jury jury jury, jury duty? Yeah. Because I <laughs> be like, oh, well, occasionally I'm on this podcast. Actually, like, yes. Get out of here. No, no, but yeah. Wow, that's so. Well, I guess I can never use an excuse to call you, it you, work. If if yeah, I I believe it is fair to say that if you went to jury duty, if you got summoned and you showed up, and they they asked you, be like, I am a political personality and pundit and writer. For a big publication, I appear on a live show every night. They'd be like, you're dismissed. <laughs> They'd be like, no, you're not that. Get out of here. You think yeah. you're famous. Well, right. because you read the news uh, every single day. Yeah. That I think that right there is like, for my job, I do nothing but read the news. It would be impossible for me to not know about what's going on in this case. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like one one aspect. Well, no, it's more than one aspect of the news. That's crazy. I mean, never serve jury duty. <laughs> if I get asked, that's what I'm definitely going to say. No, this thing. is the problem. You want to be on jury yeah, duty. Yeah, I'm not against it. It's just like a crazy thing to think, you know, when you make choices in life. That the problem is something up. the people who aren't smart enough to get off jury duty are the ones who get jury duty. Mm. Yeah, true. You, you, I, I, I always wanted to go on jury duty. I never got, I've never got summoned for jury duty. I'd, I. I'd love to be there and be like, not guilty. And they'll be like, but sir, he had the marijuana on him. It's like, <laughs> we have it. And I'd be like, not guilty. And they'd be like, but he confessed. I'd be like, I don't think you heard me. Now you're definitely and not then it would be like, for jury duty. Oh, for sure. You know, the, um, was that 12 angry men or whatever that movie was yeah. where like all the jurors and yep. they're trying to convince them. I would be the one guy and they'd, they'd be like, well, we all think this guy's guilty of possession. I'd be like, not guilty. And they'd be like. They've recovered the evidence. He's admitted to having it. He's made a, a silly excuse. I'm like, not guilty. And then one by one, the only argument I have is it shouldn't be illegal. Yeah. And then I'll be like, so I'll just keep saying it over and over again until y'all say not guilty. That's why I'd like to be on jury duty. You know, and now I, you never can. Like, this is really blowing my <laughs> mind. And now I'm, I never can. I'm never going to be able to serve on a jury. When you're all strong, you, all, feign weakness. Oh all you have to do if you never want to serve jury duty is say a simple sentence. If ever selected for jury duty, I will nullify in every circumstance. Mm. Done. I like jury nullification. It should be used yeah. more. But they, they, they'll they they'll arrest you. There's been activists outside of courts advocating for jury nullification, and they arrest you for it because they're like, you can't do this. So, but the jurors themselves can do it, and they won't get messed with. So I, it's, it's, it's interesting because, yes, you as the jury have ultimate power in deciding whether or not someone is guilty. But what they do is they'll say, you are not allowed They'll be like, you must disregard your personal feelings. The only question that matters is, so I'll give you an example. Illinois, uh, two houses. One family was asked to watch over their neighbor's house. Neighbors went on vacation. It was a small town. The police knew that this family was on vacation. The kid went in the back door, opened the fridge to steal a beer. He was like 18 or something. I say kid, he's a man. Cops driving by saw the light on, knowing the family wasn't there, approached the house, freeze. Ah, you're under arrest. What are you doing? And he's like, ah, you're like, you're robbing this house. When it went to the, uh, court, he, he said, the families were all like, we don't care. They took a beer. We, we told them they could watch the house. And they're like, nope, it's, it's burglary. It's, it's, it's theft. And then a judge was like, there's a mandatory sentence for this. It doesn't matter what you think or want the state is prosecuting. So then he said, we'll go to trial then. At trial, they were like, uh, it, it doesn't matter to the jury what you think is right. What matters is, was the law broken? He did not have permission to go in and take from the refrigerator, which is burglary, which is theft. So he must be found guilty. If those, if, if you agree with those facts, you must find him guilty. And they went, I, I, I guess he's right. They could have said, no, not guilty. Because it's, it's a poor execution of the law. So right. you nullify the case. Yes. And the judge, apparently something happened where the judge was like, I'm not sending this kid to prison over this. Are you insane? And then the prisons were like, we are not accepting this person. Are you insane? And there's like, just it's Illinois is an evil place. I'll put it that way. I'm probably like butchering the story. It's been 20 years, but that's like the gist of it that everyone was just like, why is this guy going through the system this way? The jurors were like, why are we convicting this guy? And everyone's like, oh, but you have to. But the reality was the jurors could have been like, I don't care what you say. I, feel like I don't it's care what you think. Weird He's not to, guilty. Yeah. I feel like it's weird to be in a circumstance where you're like, okay, suspend all of your values and make a decision like how could you possibly separate yourself from that actually that's like being a judge i was spending time with a girl that has been studying lauren de laguna what's up uh for her, getting her she passed the bar and, and has studied law and it, the impartiality is fascinating of being a judge you're just like i know the law that is a violation of it continue mm. stop you're violating it stop continue and that's it doesn't matter what you think what you feel you're it's just you the knowledge is present i get that for all being right. a judge but for a juror it seems impossible to ask.
That guy, Sal Roca, says, Greetings from Fremont, Ohio, Tim. We yeah. love you here, and we have JR's back in his bid to be our rep. Make Northwest Ohio great again. Awesome. Right on. Ina Baca says, I imagined Ian returning, saved by Jesus Christ, more swole, and running sub-five-second drills, rifle pistol drills. Oh, I didn't even mention it. Luke Rudkowski had me out to tactical training twice, and it's... I would, I would suggest anyone... No first aid, no. We did knife aid. practice, and then we did a lot of shooting and stuff. And what's great about it is once you do it, once you start to train, you don't have to think about it anymore. You just are able to react in those situations. That's And it's kind of like I was like, oh, I don't want to go back and talk about World War III and all this crap. But it's like what I'm doing is I'm training. It's like tactical training for my mind. If Muscle I, memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so this the, the, the metaphor of doing both the weapons training and the, the knowledge training of knowing about this horror is like I don't have to think about it now that I know. I can just react to the system. But I highly recommend tactical training and having some weapons training if you have an opportunity. All right. Paul Tascolo says, new theory. When a 2024 Trump victory is apparent, Democrats will admit they did steal the election from Trump in 2020, and therefore he can't be elected in 2024 because it would mean he'd get elected for a third term. Well, what they would say is you can't get elected a third time, not term. But yeah. Definitely not going to happen, but funny. Wilpo IRL says, Kennedy is going to win against Nikki Haley and Dean Phillips. Trump is going to spend the week of the convention in house arrest. Biden can't walk. How is he going to run? Ha <laughs> ha. The election is the dark horse election. It would be really funny if just like two months before the election, some random person no one's ever heard of just appears and just gets all the support. I was picturing like they're, they give him like a trophy at the end of the at the end of the track and they're like, OK, you guys got to run. Whoever gets that's going to be president. And they're like, literally just comes down to you got to run for president. Well, we know who would trip and fall over their own feet. Uh, do we need a strong commander, man? Yeah, we do. Yes, I Trump's think we the only all guy, man. Him. I'm telling you. I mean, I think we all agree with that. But he, he's he's absolutely the guy that we need right now. We need to cauterize a lot of things. Yeah, and he's the match that's going to do it. I, 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 I firmly believe it. All right, William Trash says Tim and Ian, my girlfriend's dog Leo, was put down today. He would have been 14 in January. She would really appreciate it if you guys could say a few words. He was a good boy, Leo wasn't just a good boy. He was the best of boys. And we mourn his passing for every good boy is a best friend. Leo's <laughs> spirit is still here uh, witnessing you. And um, he will be for a while and then he'll go off and he'll be, he'll be back. He'll be back with you. He's going to evolve too. He's going to come back and inhabit something greater. Thank you. All right. Well, Sorry to hear, William. Sorry to hear. Uh, but but uh, condolences. All right. Riding with Ryan says, I saw the movie We Were Soldiers as a kid. Pretty young for the movie, but not too young. I've grown up strongly against war. Yeah. How about Saving Private Ryan? Yeah, that's where you're going. Is that brutal enough? Platoon? What else Platoon's do we have? pretty blue. Full metal too. jacket. Full metal jacket. Full that's metal what jacket. I was yeah. 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 Apocalypse now. Just have your, have your six year old kids watch Full Metal Jacket. I'm kidding. Nobody well, says anything like, okay, I guess. <laughs> They'll think basic training school until they get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Total Recall. Have your kids all watch Total Recall. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's pretty brutal. The original one, not the remake, the original one. Yeah. When his eyes are about to explode from his head yeah. and the lady has three boobs. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make them like they used to. All right, all right. Ben says, protests happening in Minneapolis started at 6 p.m. Central Time. They were chanting, from the river to the sea, we will never be free. I, I, is that what they're? How do you even chant that? If you, you will never be free. What? That well, they chant from the river the to the sea. Palestine will be free. There's like this. This is a rhythm to it, right? From the river to the sea, we will never be free. Is that how you do it? Be extend yeah. it. There must be. I don't know if this is perfectly paraphrased here. From yeah, we will never be free. I don't know sea. about that. We will be free. Uh, we will never be free. No, we will never. Yeah, I don't know why you why you'd say that. Yeah. I don't know why you're supposed to say that. I'm sure they're being misquoted, but who knows? Maybe not. Jason Barker says, I think war should be put up to a vote for the, from the people. And if you vote in favor of war, you get put at the front of the line for conscription. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, totally. Everyone would then vote against war every yes. single time. Every time. Well, technically, if our representatives listen to their constituents and the president actually followed the rules, then we would have that mechanism. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you could also, here's the choices. If you support war, if you vote in favor of it, you're conscripted frontline infantry. If you vote against it, you voted against it. Congratulations. You don't got to fight or you can abstain. And what would happen is if you really do want Thor but don't want to fight, you just don't vote. And then maybe the people who do fight and want war 
will vote for it and then they will win the vote. So it's still possible for there to be war in certain circumstances without the majority of people voting for it. But I think overwhelmingly what would happen is the no's would be 80%. Yeah. Or the Democrats would steal the election. <laughs> The Democrats would just rig. We're going to war in World War Three again. It's the when machines. And just then the Republicans the would be like, slow down there, Democrats. And they would go the speed limit and do the same thing. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, shout out to my, shout out all my fellow handymen. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like That's funny. the handymen are billionaires with private jets because they're the only <laughs> ones who know how to fix things and no one else does. Dude, Raymond G. Stanley truly is handy. Yeah. And uh, handy, yeah. Randy Marsh is like, if, if, if you fix my stove, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you geology. I have a PhD. Like, it's a completely worthless profession in terms of, like, day-to-day -day living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what do geologists do right now? Uh, maybe they make some money, like, surveying, I'm imagining. Well, I know that there there are some that they they, they, they do uh, aerial, uh, they get aerial photographs. And yeah. They look for, for minerals, veins, and mm. things like that. They know where to find them and why. But I mean, like in terms of actual geological research, what do they do? A lot of geologists that I know work in the petroleum industry. Yeah. Um, that's mm, where their background is because of science. I couldn't say. I used to say I wanted to date a car guy because then I never had to deal with my car again. You know, like <laughs> having someone in your life who is practical and can actually fix things is great. True. Highly recommend Boggart's it. IT says 60 slash 66, uh, 60 of 66 credits, 30K in debt, no degree because I failed college algebra three times. Now running my own uh, phone repair business and could use that 30K. Yup. I, I just want to mention something as a total aside because this person's name was Bogart. Do you guys know what a Bogart is from Harry Potter? No. What is it? Like a like a witch? It's not a witch, like a troll in the in the in the woods. In no. the woods? A Bogart? Uh, yeah, those are the things that take the shape of your worst fear. Oh. And uh everyone's right now saying, like, what is he talking about? No, 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 hold on. Like this I was thinking about this recently. This is a classic reference. What do you mean you don't get it? Yeah, like what a Bogart is? It's a Harry Potter, man. Come on, but, uh, but this is important because in the movie, in the book, it's like the teacher, he looks at it and turns into the moon because he's a werewolf and he's scared of, of that or whatever. And then I was just thinking about it and I'm like, the concept created by J.K. Rowling is really stupid because it's impossible. You know why? Do you know what every person would see if a manifestation of their worst fear appeared before them? Um, a lot of people in a crowd. They're dead know. kids. Yes. Their dead wife, their dead husband, their dead child. The greatest fear of the average person is not bees or clowns. It is staring at the dead body of their loved one. Yeah. True. And I'm like, oh, so that was a weird idea. But anyway, I just like, Bogart reminded me of this thing I was thinking about. And I'm like, but then actually, apparently that was in the book. That like, I guess it was like uh, uh, Ron's mom. Yeah. Ron's mom saw her kids. Dead. Which was That's very sad, right? Brutal. And also when they do it in the book, you have to remember they're like, you know, I don't even know, middle school age, high school age children. And so right. the fears are very different. I think Ron's fear was getting yelled at by essentially his mom or something like that. Fear like, is an interesting uh, word because there's probably different kinds of fear. I was up really high, like 28 stories and out on a balcony. And I was like, whoa, push couldn't like that weird feeling of like getting that fear of the heights is different than the fear of losing a loved one like that terror. But it's similar, but it's it's like it's hitting different areas yeah, of my body. I get what you mean. Yeah. Different kinds of fear. Is there is there a list of the seven different fears or something like the different love? Oh, that's awesome. That's because there it's true. Mm -hmm. Like the fear I feel when I see like a wasp flying, flying towards me is a totally different feeling from the fear of like when war is about to start. Like the feeling that I got when they announced the troop, the the, the personnel deployments. I'll be careful with troops and the the two carrier groups going to the Mediterranean. It's like a sinking feeling of mm -hmm. dread. A but then when like when I see a wasp, it's like a shock where I'm just like ah, like an adrenaline rush, but not. I'm not really scared. It's more of like a, uh, you know what I Apparently mean? Apparently there are three types of fear, main types, primal, irrational, and rational. No. So no. the war type would be irrational. It would be rational no. fear to fear war. Whereas my no, 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 no. You're standing up high it's, it's on a balcony is irrational or no, no. maybe it's primal. No, that's not irrational. Irrational fear is like phobia. It's like, oh, it's a clown. Oh, I'm terrified. That's irrational. And primal would be? Bees. Something, yeah, you something that could kill you. Snakes. Something, Something that in induces fight or flight, probably. Yeah, so there there are things like when cats see cucumbers, that's yeah. primal fear. Like, they're clearly not scared of the cucumber, but... I think it could be a snake. Yeah. Be, because the cats evolved to be alert when they see something that looks like a snake, and it's helped them survive. It's more primal. Rational is like, a bee will sting me, I will die. 
And so I am I am afraid of that. Irrational is, ah, oh, it's a clown run. Like, that's just a guy in a costume. Why are you why are you scared of that? When I'm up high and I get that fear of the of the falling off the edge, I wonder if that's primal because like yes, some ancient probably. ancestor yeah. fell from great heights and it's in my no, DNA no, no, or no, no, something. No. Because the humans who survived didn't fall. And so the humans who are more likely to be afraid of heights were more likely to survive. So now within you, it's ingrained. But uh, in terms of the different types of fear, I'm saying like you get um, a jump scares. You turn a movie on and, the, and then the ghost goes, boo, and you're like, oh, like primal fear. That's not primal fear. Stuff jumping out of you at you. No, bro. I'm talking about, you know, there's like uh, Eros and Phobos yeah, yeah. or whatever. That's not the same thing as you're describing. These are these no, are this totally is not. Different. That's a Greek. The Greeks have the 10 kinds of love. But that's what I'm talking this about. This is like three because there's, types of there's rational fear. and irrational love as well. Some people irrationally love inanimate objects and they should not. You know what I mean? That's totally different this from what I'm trying to say. This is a great topic. This would be well worth it is diving interesting. into. My but biggest fear is a geriatric president. <laughs> well, you got it. Uh, I'm scared to live in America living right in, now. Living in a constant nightmare. Yeah. You open the <laughs> cabinet, the bogger comes out, and it's Joe Biden. Dude, you're <laughs> joking. That's the best part. <laughs> All right, here we go. Polly Puree says, I worked at a nuclear power plant years ago. Water very tightly contains the radiation. They kept the rods in a swimming pool. Yeah, so there's a, a story of a scuba diver who got sucked into like an intake valve and was swimming in the reactor pool, totally fine because water blocks radiation. Yeah. Probably in the spent fuel pool. If he was in the reactor pool, it'd be a different story. Then there you go. Yeah. That, that might've been it. There's but, also a, a, I believe it was in Japan, um, construction workers or, or um, they, they, so they were working around the spent fuel pool and they had a glass tube, right? And they stuck the tube into the water and he looked into it and it, pretty much fried his brain no I don't, I, no, I, I, no I don't know if that's like tribal to the nuclear industry if it's like the boogeyman and we all talk about it but i've heard that story because he created a 20. path for the radiation yeah, yeah. that's crazy and, and that's why i always get bothered in movies when they have like a remote control underwater drone or something because i've done this drone work i'm like it's impossible you can't broadcast signals through water it blocks radiation so that if you have it, underwater drones are wired mm -hmm. and that's why the drones they do have they're wired and they do shallow surveys of ships and stuff but going deeper, you, you, it has to be wired connection because water blocks radiation. Yeah. Also, I love how in space, liquid nitrogen is what they use to insulate to keep something warm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. You, like you'd think, you, you think it's the opposite. Yeah, you would. But that's not how vacuums work. Also, you don't freeze in outer space. I, I can't stand movies when it's like they're in outer space freezing. Is that because there's no moisture? Because there's no, there's no convection. The heat can't escape your body to anywhere, so it stays where it is. And builds up and you get hotter and hotter and then you you die. Yeah. So like in order for heat to leave Boy, your body, you need to blow it away and transfer the heat from one. It has to it, 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 convection. That's kind of like a nuclear meltdown situation. That's why the stuff melts down because it can't get the heat out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In outer space, there's nowhere for the heat to go. You're in a vacuum. So you melt down. That's it's like, wild. It, it, yeah, it's like in a thermos. The reason the way these things work is they're vacuumed on, th you know, on all sides, but one. And so heat can only escape up, whereas with a regular mug, is escaping in every direction. Anyway, the more you know. Oh, the worst. So the best part of having a political show is dropping the All the fuel. science we learn along the way. It's it absolutely <laughs> how they contain spent nuclear fuel. All right. Tyrion says, as a Coloradan, TDS is strong here in the cities. It, 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 what were we saying? They, 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 they yeah. uh, secure nuclear they spent put, fuel? They, yeah, they, they put, put spent vacuum. nuclear. Yeah, they draw, they draw a vacuum on the container. They actually backfill it with helium. And wow. then they, yeah, they draw the vacuum backfill with helium and then the, uh, the, the, the stainless steel shell can heat, but it's does the, does the helium help like normalize the pressure mm -hmm. while and, and the temperature, right? So yeah. It, interesting. Yeah. You know, helium's finite and we're running out. Yep. We got to fuse some hydrogen. Well, once we figure out fusion, we'll be able to mass produce uh, helium too. Mm -hmm. so, so about that deuterium oxide. That's, that's right. Heavy hydrogen. That's when right. you add a neutron to the hydrogen, smash it together in a palladium lattice. I was talking with uh, Richie earlier. He was like, fission is, which one is fission and fusion? And we were talking about fusion reactors and fusion engines. And uh, it was an interesting conversation. That's, I'm going to connect you guys afternoon. to a buddy of mine that actually has a startup company. And uh, he, he's he's right now going through the licensing process and, and through uh, grant the grant process with the DOE that he's probably the strongest advocate right now in the country to recycle spent nuclear fuel. Genius guy. I think I think you'd love him. Yeah. All right. Keegan Mazo says, welcome back, Ian. There's a Russian Orthodox monastery being built in Wayne, West Virginia. I am planning a pilgrimage to it soon. I would like to know if you wanted to go and see it as well. To get into contact with me, you can find me on the Discord, Keegan Mazo. 
I, we should film I'm it. Really, yeah, that That'd does sound cool. cool. We should do like a little mini, like ten minute visit to the Russian Orthodox monastery and like you know ask them what it's all about. That'd be great. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Fun stuff. We'll uh, we'll grab some more. We'll grab some more. Where are we at? Uh, Just leave me alone. Says Florida Trump County. What does DeSantis not understand about that? <laughs> well, there you go. Madeline Bradshaw says, I work in nuclear engineering. You guys are doing a decent job explaining. Risk is actually small and there's a ton of backup protection. It would bring a lot of high paying technical jobs. It's clean energy. Carbon, carbon emission free. We should be building nuclear plants all over the place. It, so to be clear to the audience, I am not an engineer by trade. I have a master's degree in business. I was someone that was in management. Um, you know, that I, I managed and led a lot of smart engineers that were a heck of a lot smarter than me. So, you know, my, my, uh, my scientific knowledge or my technical knowledge is all just based on observation. So, you know, some of the questions you asked me, I can't answer them because I didn't have the technical background. So, all right. Uh, not, I, not a fake it till you make it. Guy. You did answer them, but you were <laughs> honest. That it's you it's didn't all from me, me learning and, and observing the people that that worked with me. Isaac Gorski says, why the hell don't we just use the wheels of the cars to create motion powered cars with their own power source? That's right. I saw this really funny video. You may have seen it where it's a car and they've got uh, a generator strapped to the back right wheel to. So when the wheel spins, it spins the generator and is charging. And they're like, wow, that's so smart. And these people are so dumb. They don't understand the conservation of energy. They don't understand the basic laws of thermodynamics that all he's doing is robbing his vehicle of energy mm -hmm. by doing that. Yeah, but you know, it, I will say, shout out to Mythbusters. They created an, an, an internal, what, what was it? It was an internal kinetic motor. And so the, the idea was that you could not create an engine that was uh, inside a, a boat to cause motion because equal and opposite reaction, but it actually disproved it. And they were able to can create forward motion with an internal engine. Basically the way it worked was it fires, a, it, it sits in the middle of the boat, doesn't touch the water and it fires a piston. And then when the piston hits the end, it pulls everything forward. And the idea is the pressure of moving the piston forward creates an opposite reaction in the other direction, which should prevent the boat from moving forward. But the, I, I'm pretty sure that it was Mythbusters who did this. They actually were able to drive the boat forward using internal. Yeah, I think it's because yeah, the earth is round and you're kind of always falling forward when you're in the water. Well, there goes the flat earthers. Well, sorry, <laughs> Ian, guys. that is very wrong. <laughs> it might have something to do with it. But the way the waves always kind of move towards the shore, like that is something. To do. The moon also is pulling you. The issue, I think it was actually really simple math, was that the the uh, initial reaction, which fired the piston, does create uh, a reaction in both equal directions. Reaction, right? And then the catching of the piston creates a minor shock in one direction is what caused it. And then they've also got really interesting, uh, uh, I was watching something about using, uh, what was it, like firing electrons or photons inside a device and then at, a, uh, 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 so this would work in outer space, the amount of force created from electrons hitting a plate internally would, would have no effect on Earth because of friction and weight and gravity. But in outer space, it would build up enough to where over time it would create speed. Yeah, when uh, when you heat up one, it's kind of how spores travel through space. The brighter side of the spores on top and then the dark sides underneath. So the brighter side orients towards a star and then begins to spin, which creates gyration and momentum. I just love science. Hmm. It's so fun. Regarding All right. Catching, well, we got we, we got to go. Regarding, we'll just do this really quick. Regarding catching energy out of a system like out of your car, you can get what's called extropy, which is a little bit of lost energy can be reused. It doesn't give you enough to propel the system like a computer. All that heat coming out of your computer can be used to like heat water and can heat the pipes in your house. But, All yeah. right. We're going to go to the members show. So head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. The members only show is starting in a couple minutes. You don't want to miss it. We're going to have callers talk to us and our guests. It's going to be great. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Smash that like button. Share the show. JR, do you want to shout anything out? No, just, uh, you know, thanks for having me on. And uh, shout out to all the people in Northwest Ohio. We're going to beat Marcy Captor this cycle. And um, I appreciate a follow on Twitter or any other form of social media. JR, F-O-R, Ohio is my website. How far from Pittsburgh? Uh, about three hours. Three hours? Yeah. We're, we're looking at doing an event in Pittsburgh. We'll have to invite the Ohio. Oh, I'd love to come. To out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They love you in, uh, in, in the ninth, dude. Yeah. They love well, us. They love us red, white, and blue Americans, man. I, I went to Pittsburgh last weekend and I've never been recognized more. Basically, like, I, I went to a poker room and the lady was there. She was like, I knew it was you. And I was like, oh, thanks. And then, like, every table, they're like, oh, hey, look at us. I'm like, damn, Pittsburgh people know me, I Midwest guess. Midwest is the best, man. I think, yeah. But I think it's because I have Chicago sensibilities. 
And so go. it's like Midwesterners yeah. are, you know, we, we kind of see these things and we're not the coasts. So right. It makes sense. But anyway. Well, I'm all for the pro Pittsburgh talking points, even though I've never been there. Uh, I am really glad that we were here tonight. It was a fun, fun conversation. I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for TimCast.com. You should go to Twitter and Instagram and follow at TimCast News all the time, always. And if you want to follow me personally, I'm uh, Hannah Claire.B on Instagram and HC Brimlow on Twitter. Thank you guys so much. And of course, welcome back to Ian. Once Thank again. you, Anna Claire. I'm Ian Cross, and you guys follow me. Hey, anywhere, everywhere, hit me up all over the internet. Follow me everywhere, and I'll, I'll talk to you there. Jr. People are hitting your website. What's the site? Uh, Jr. F O R Ohio dot com. Gorgeous. Good to see you, man. Thanks, brother. Uh, pleasure meeting you, Jr. Uh, I am Surge dot com. I'm excited for the after show. You guys should join up and talk to us. One day I'll be on the Discord, but not anytime soon. Catch you later. We will see you all over at timcast.com in about a minute. Thanks for hanging out.